Good morning, guys, and welcome out to Revolution. So this is just going to be an open discussion about um, Bible versions, about Bible translations, about the biblical text, and basically just a roundabout discussion about bibliology. And so um, we're going to look at a few different things because sometimes I'll do a whole program on a certain topic. It might be 1 John 5, 7 or whatever. And I don't get to just sort of surf around and have a bit of a tinker with um, things that are being said on Facebook or Twitter or just um, looking at some random scriptures and things like that. And so uh, I just thought to begin, I just read some verses that have to do with the word of God. Now, <clears throat> I do believe there is a distinction between the word of God, capital W, and the word of God, small w, okay? Now, um, in Revelation 19, 13, it says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. So that's the name of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, capital W, and the word was with God, and the word was God, okay? So the word, um, God was manifest in the flesh, but we know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this is in John chapter 1, verse 14. And so what's the distinction between the word of God with a capital W and the word of God with a small w? Well, you can get the word of God with a small w. This is the, the Bible here, the word of God. Now, I might spill coffee all over it this morning and it becomes unusable. It's just, it's ruined it. And so it's like, what, what do I do with it? Well, I could probably, you know, destroy it, throw it in the bin, burn it, whatever. And it's not hurting Jesus whatsoever. I can just go and buy another one. Um, but the word of God, when the word of God was before Pontius Pilate, um, they commissioned him to be uh, whipped, to be bashed, to be have his beard plucked out and to be crucified. And so you can actually come against and hurt the word of God, the word in the flesh. So you've got to make that distinction because what a lot of people do is they go, well, this is God. No, this is when you read in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, it talks about there's a sword coming out of the mouth of Christ. Christ is called the word of God. It says his name is called the capital W word of God. Okay. But out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. And this two-edged sword, usually the, the Bible is very clear that that is the word of God, small w. So it's, it's the words that he's speaking. Now, the word of God speaks the word of God. Okay, so there are two words of God. One is in the flesh. It's He's still in the flesh because it says in... Uh, second John, it says, um, he that does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh uh, is not of God. And so when it says is come in the flesh, this is the King James translator's way of saying he was formerly manifest in the flesh. He is still in the flesh. So he resurrected in, in a body. Okay. So he's not just a spirit floating around. He's a, in a resurrected body as well. He's in the flesh and he will forever be in the flesh, which is quite interesting. And so that's why he can show people you know, the scars on his hands because uh, he's in the flesh. So the word of God, Jesus Christ, speaks the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures. Okay, These two never contradict each other. Now, I had someone sit me down one time and say, Nick, you're far too Bible-minded. You've got to flow in the Holy Spirit. You've got to follow... Um, the leadings of the Holy Spirit and all this sort of stuff. Usually they say, be led, be be led. <laughs> and it's like um, there were some guys who were carrying around a tiny piece of lead. And it's like, oh, I feel led. There you go. <laughs> the Bible says to go and preach to all creation. There, I feel led to go to China. I feel led to go, you know, because the Bible says just go out and preach everywhere. Oh, I feel led to go here. Yes, you might have you know, a certain stirring to go to a place and God, you know, works on your heart to go somewhere. But pretty much he wants you to go and preach everywhere. Okay. So there's, it's sort of like if in the book of Acts, Paul was going and preaching everywhere he could. Sometimes 
Satan hindered him, and sometimes the Holy Spirit hindered him. But he was basically full throttle going out and just wherever he could. Was he going, okay, well, let, let's pray about this. Uh, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't want me to go there. He was trying to get into these places, and it was God had to sort of put blockers in front of him and point him in a different direction. So sometimes Satan was there and it hindered him from, from doing things. But clearly he um, he didn't go, well, I just feel led to do this and led to do that. He was just like, wherever I can go, whatever I can do, I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, whatever gives God the most glory. And so the word of God, Jesus in the flesh, speaks the word of God. These two do not contradict each other. So when I was sat down and told I'm too Bible-minded, I'm too caught up in the Bible, I need to flow in the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit do not contradict one another, okay? They are in unison. And so if you are hearing from the Holy Spirit and he says something that is contrary to Scripture, then you are not to follow that. You're not to believe it. Um because the word of God takes precedence. Now, uh, some people are like, well, if you change the Bible, you change God. Okay, you, you cannot change God. God just doesn't change. You might change the perception that you have of God. Because if someone dubbed over my words here and I just said, hey, um, I like Joe Biden, <laughs> you would get the wrong idea of me and who I am, what I represent, or... Um, and so when you get the word of God and you have these modern versions and people have scrubbed out words, they've deleted words, they've replaced words. So it's saying things that God didn't necessarily want to say. So it's become the word of God and a mix. It's a mixture. And God hates a mixture. You know, God, God, yeah, all the way through the, the Hebrews were very distinct, um, even to the point where they weren't to mix certain fabrics and things like that. Why was God doing that? Well, he wanted a distinct people, okay? He wanted people who were making distinctions between the fine, minute details in life. And we should be doing that today. We should be making a clear distinction bet between what is a corruption and what is truth. Now, I understand that there are um, issues that they, they're sort of like a, things could... Um, they can look like a corruption, but they don't really matter. Okay. So I was looking at um, some eschatology last night. We were looking at um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it talks about um, the day of Christ or the day of the Lord. Now, I believe the day of Christ is the correct reading. Um, the critical text says the day of the Lord. Now, I'm not happy with their reading. I'm happy with the day of Christ because I believe it's the correct reading. But at the end of the day, I don't think it has any doctrinal significance. Okay, so there are some some um, changes that have absolutely really no doctrinal significance whatsoever, because the Lord is Christ, you know. And some places it says the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So which one is it? Because some people make one is um, the day of Christ. It's a happy thing for believers. The other one's the day of the Lord, or it's a you know angry thing for non-believers. Um, but then it says the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I guess that's both, you know, um, where there are changes that have absolutely no difference. But this is where I draw the line because uh, someone like Mark Ward, he basically says there's really never any difference. They're, the Texas Receptus and the critical text are so close that there are no significant changes. I, th I think that's um, ridiculous. And just a cursory look through the bible uh, matthew chapter 5 where it says if you get angry um, you are in danger of the judgment but in the king james it says if you get angry without a cause or without a good reason for being angry you're in danger of the judgment so if you're just walking around being a psycho um, uh, treating people like rubbish and you're you're in danger of judgment and so um but clearly jesus got angry See, if you read that verse, you go, wow, I should never get angry, you know, or else I'm in danger of the judgment. But then later on, Jesus got angry with the scribes and the Pharisees and he's flipping tables over and all this sort of stuff. But if you understand it's without a cause, that's the Greek, um, the Greek um, words that are missing in the critical text. 
without a cause, the the issue is you have to have a good reason to be angry. Yes, Jesus got angry, um, but at the end of the day, he was not in sin. And then you just keep reading through the Bible. You have the um, doxology of the Lord's Prayer. You have issues like Jesus saying, I'm not going up to the feast. He said, yet. But in the critical text, I'm not going up to the feast, but then he goes up. And even him saying, I'm not going up to the feast, goes against Jewish customs and the law. So he would be saying, I'm sinning. See, this is the thing. It makes Jesus a sinner. If he got angry, he's in danger of judgment. Is Christ in danger of judgment? And these are just like bog standard things that, you know, back in the 1990s, looking at a few tracks and looking at a few things, it's like, wow, the, these are significant differences that cause Jesus to be a sinner in the critical text. And, and I can't, I can't um, work with that. So when I think it's very important for us to make a distinction between the word of God in the flesh and the word of God in print. Okay. Because the word of God in the flesh, you can pull his beard out, you can smack him in the head, you can nail him to a cross, he bleeds. Um, but the thing is, if I spill coffee all over this, rip a few pages by accident, the dog eats it and whatever, and I have to throw it in the bin or burn it, that's not affecting God whatsoever. And so there has to be that distinction made or else some people find themselves in trouble. And uh, some people can find themselves in a situation where they're actually almost worshipping the word above the capital W word, Jesus. Because there are some people who are not born again who support the King James. There are people who are religious devils, just as religious and just as unsaved as the, um, the Sadducees and some of the scribes and Pharisees were. The people who Jesus was rebuking, there are people in those camps, um, in, in the King James camps, um, Texas Receptors camps, who are just as religious as that. And they have religious spirits and they say strange and bizarre things. And um, what I find is when it comes to truth, if you have something that's very true, but the devil doesn't really want people to know that it's true, what he does, he sets up 20 people who look really strange. <laughs> Uh, around that truth and you have to battle your way through those issues you have to get past the stigma of oh, if i you know believe in that position oh people are gonna you know come against me or people are gonna tease me or whatever you just have to get over all that because the truth is truth regardless of how many people will laugh at you how many people will taunt you will tease you whatever you just have to follow the truth and um, understanding where the word of God is, is a very powerful thing because you have to have confidence in the word of God. If you are not sure about the word of God, you have doubts. Um, you know, clearly the Bible is against doubting. You know, look at Peter, he's walking on water. He starts to sing, um, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Um, there are two things that nullify the word of God. It's unbelief. So people just don't believe that it's the word of God. And there's traditions of men. And sometimes these two things come into play when it comes to bibliology. Because we can have unbelief. We, we, we're going through the Bible. Now, the, when I first got saved, I was um, in a church and they all read the New King James. So I started to read it. And the first Bible I had didn't have marginal notes in it. It, it had a few here and there, like it, um, Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. It said, or, a son, or sons of the gods. And it was like, oh, that's weird, you know. But then there were, um, I actually got like a leather bound Bible and, and it had all these references there and uh, it had NU omits this and uh, the M adds this or omits this. And I was, I would be reading through the Bible gladly reading a story. And then I would look in the margin and go, hang on, it says that verse shouldn't be in there or it says this part is missing from the verse. So I'd read through it and it was just doubt straight away. Like, um, these people don't know where the word of God is. This is strange. This is weird. And so it's the, I call them doubt producing footnotes simply because that was the experience that I had as a new convert. Now, a lot of you know the story of before I was a Christian, um, I was given a Bible and I was encouraged to read it. So I went home, grabbed the Bible. 
and I started to read it and I got to Matthew chapter five and it said that you know they're not sure if these words are in the in the Bible or not. It was some sort of footnote. I think it was in an NIV or something like that. And I didn't read it from then on. I just I actually threw the Bible in the corner and said, "What a load of rubbish!" They don't even know which reading is correct. And so, when I had read other books, now they hadn't convinced me that that were truth. Um, you know, looking at, you know, Hare Krishna stuff. Because in, in Melbourne, the city I grew up in, if you're sort of walking around the streets, people would just give you stuff, you know. And um, I, I would go home and just read the whole thing. And I read all sorts of different books, but um, none of them convinced me they were truth. But at least they weren't saying things like, we're not really sure if this should be in this book. You know, <laughs> to me, that was just insanity. And looking back, uh, I believe that I was thinking correctly because how can you have something that is contradictory like that um, now I do understand that it, it is a different context today because you know most of our society is atheistic most of Australia is completely atheistic it doesn't matter if you look at the stats and facts and figures you know 25% Roman Catholic 25% Anglican blah 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 you talk to most people they're like no we, we come from um, stardust and we evolved and you know there's no god and most people say that openly and so the vast majority of people who i interact with street preaching witnessing and things like that they say that type of thing so uh, it's different growing up in an atheistic society and then you have these footnotes in the bible saying this and that then in the time of 1611 it was a faith-based society where people actually really did believe the words of god Yes, there were pockets of unbelief and atheism and, you know, deism and things like that, that um, people believe. But at the end of the day, most people, most of the things were in scripture, like say any marginal notes or anything like that, to clarify things, if anything, because they had had a succession of other Bibles that came before and people knew about it. They knew about Tyndale. They knew about um, you know, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Coverdale Bible, etc., And they knew there were a succession of Greek texts that were getting more and more refined. And so in some of the footnotes, they had to clarify things like, well, this verse here in the Bishop's Bible um, says this, or in the Geneva Bible says that, but we have this reading here. And so oftentimes the marginal notes are there to clarify, not to go, well, we're, not, we're just not sure. And that's where people get it wrong. They go back and look at the 1611 and go, well, these are alternative readings. But there, there has to be a distinction made between, um, you know, the alternative readings in the New King James, where they say in the New King James Study Bible that if you, um, if you read the New King James, you can sort of choose your own adventure. You can go on the critical text um, readings because they're all in the margin, or you can go with the um, majority text readings, which are in the margin as well, the Hodges and Fasted um, majority text. And so um, this is um, this is an issue because they the, the marginal notes, as far as I'm aware, and as far as um, my own personal experience, created doubt in me. When, when I looked at marginal notes, I went straight away, uh, no, this is... They don't know what they're doing. They don't know which reading. They're not standing behind a particular reading and saying, this is it. So um, that was a, a big issue for me. When I first became a Christian, I started comparing um, Bibles. In the first week of me sort of joining a church, now I've probably been a Christian for maybe a month, maybe um, six weeks, and I joined a church. And I went, went into the Christian bookshop and I grabbed an old King James and I and it said the Proverbs because I was memorizing Proverbs 1 to 7 because it said get wisdom in all in all everything get wisdom I'm like okay well Proverbs is wisdom if I can get this this will help my life because I was my whole life was upside down so I'm like I started um, to memorize um, and it said the um, to know the ways of the Lord and his dark sayings and I was like hang on that's not what it says um, in the in the New King James. It says, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their darker sayings. And I actually thought, 
hang on, this old King James is saying we've got to understand dark sayings. I'm thinking like occult sayings. What's going on here? And so it took a, took a while. I actually asked this in a Bible study. I've been in the church for a week and I'm like, uh, excuse me, can I just ask a question? In the New King James, it says this. In the Old King James, it says that. And the Bible study leaders sort of just got angry with me. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know why it says that. And it's like, oh, okay. And I I'd, I'd had no idea that there's this whole Bible version issue thing that if you go, oh, King James, you're, you're, you wear a Ruckman hat and you're, you're a rippling follower and all the rest of it, all the stigma that goes along with that. And so, but I saw it said dark sayings, but now I understand they're hidden sayings or things that not everyone's seen. And I, I understand the full picture of that now. But so from my early Christianity, I was well aware of um, issues. Now, when, when I had my New King James and it had all the marginal notes, what I started to do was actually cross them out. So I had my black pen and I've gone through and in the middle of the reference, I've, I've crossed out all these things that says the NU or the Nestle Alain United Bible Society text. That's what NU stands for. It says this or it omits this verse or it takes out these 42 words in a row and it's like, so I started scribbling those out, and by the end, of, by the end, my Bible had just had all these things crossed out. And people used to say to me, "Why have you got all these things crossed out in your Bible?" I'd say, "Oh, well, that's the like the marginal notes. I, I just can't follow them. They, they they just produce doubt in my mind." So I'm organically coming to that position, being born again, being enlightened, being transformed out of darkness into the kingdom of light straight away I'm seeing these issues. Now, if I had been in a church group for, you know, five years and they had told me, you know, you're if you follow the King James, you're a cultist and all this sort of stuff, I probably would have gone a different route. But thankfully, no one had indoctrinated me with all that yet. And so, you know, people later on tried to sort of bully me into certain positions and it still happens today. But to me, it's just an organic thing. You just basically point, you, you're like the... The little boy who goes, hang on, the king's got no clothes. What's going on here? But no one will say it for fear of ramifications from the king. That little boy is just like, oh, the king has no clothes. So I was just like, hang on, this Bible's saying this, this Bible's saying that. And so sometimes I was, I was, you know, hundred percent correct. Sometimes it's like, well, I just need to learn a bit more about the English language or whatever. But at the end of the day, um, this has been something that I, I think is a very important part of Christianity because a lot of people don't look into this issue and they stay in doubt for many years. Some people just allow doubts just to sit in their mind and stagnate. And there's certain things in the Bible they go, well, to me that seems like an obvious contradiction and they never look into it. They never clear it up. So in the back of their mind, there's this niggling you know, it's contradiction, contradiction. And then they just think the Bible has contradictions. I've seen older Christians to blurt out stuff. It's like, well, the Bible has this contradiction in it, this one, this one. And it's like, haven't you ever studied these things? I, I can't go for, you know, a day, a, a week having the doubt in my mind. I have to sort this out. I focus on those issues. If there's a, a bit of doubt, you focus on it until you get to the point where it's clear. And so there's been a lot of scriptures that I've studied throughout the years that, I'm convinced myself, you know, it's like, well, that's obviously the word of God and I'm absolutely convinced, but I haven't sort of set aside the study because it's one thing to just go through and study it yourself and you're like, oh, I'm convinced. But it's another thing to teach everyone else and to show them how you got there because it takes a lot longer. <clears throat> we got um, quite a lot of comments here. Um, so Mr. Sam Urang X says they are almost synonymous. Yes, the Word of God and um, the, with the capital W and the Word of God with a small w, and they are in agreement together. Um, so Dwayne Green says, hey, Nick, hey, Dwayne, how's Canada? I don't buy the argument that there are no significant differences. Yeah, um, yeah Mark 16, 9 to 20 is a good example. That is a huge significant difference, and I think for anyone, regardless of where, whether you're a cessationist or whether you're a continuist, this issue is um, 
it's huge because these signs shall follow those that believe. And when you go through those signs, um, clearly that is what the early church was doing. Now, so I, I have a bit of a different take on on some of those signs than most people do. Uh, so when it comes to the, obviously there's the, um, in my name, they shall uh, cast out devils. You know, they shall speak in new tongues. It says if they drink anything deadly, it shall not hurt them. Okay. So my understanding of that is like with Jesus at Gethsemane, he was holding the cup and saying, Father, take this away from me. Did he actually have a literal cup that he was holding up saying, Father, take this away from me? No, it was the cup of his sufferings. It was um, his martyrdom. Now, when Jesus' disciples brought their mummy <laughs> and mummy along to say to Jesus, can this one sit on this in your right hand and the other one on the left? It's a pretty big call, you know. <laughs> Go and ask the Messiah. We can sit next to him for eternity. And so he said, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? What's he talking about there? He's talking about the cup of sufferings, the cup of martyrdom. And they said, we are able. He said, well, you don't really understand what you're talking about, but you will drink this cup. And But he said to sit on the right or left is it's not mine to give, you know, sort of thing. But clearly there is a drinking in of the sufferings. Jesus said, take this cup away from me. So when it says... I might actually get um, Mark, Mark 16, KJV. You won't go to the other versions because it will just have brackets around it. Um, Mark 16, KJV says, these signs shall follow them that believe. So the one that I was talking about says uh, that if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And Jesus also said, you know, um, not one hair of your head shall perish when you're being killed for your faith. How's that possible? Well, it's obviously talking about you will have a resurrected body, etc. So when it says if you drink any deadly thing, basically, if you study this out in the Greek, there is a hapex legomen on there. So some people have a bit of trouble sort of trying to work out where, you know, how to define these terms. But basically, it's saying if you drink in death, if you drink in something that will kill you, and so it's very relatable to Christ holding up the cup or holding up his sufferings and saying, take this cup away from me, Father. So um, it's the drinking in. You're drinking in death and it won't hurt you. When you die, you will live again. So these are signs that follow those who believe. What's a sign um, that has followed Christians? Martyrdom. Just read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs is very clear um, that this is a this is a huge sign. Martyrdom has followed the church all the way through the New Testament. It'll say, yeah, everything will be nice and rosy, tiptoe through the tulips sort of thing, and you'll be persecuted. <laughs> it's like, oh. But um, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's just a fact. It's in the Bible. So... Um, some people like James White and others, they say, if you drink any deadly thing, like, you you know, you're getting the poison, you're, you're just having a sip of poison. But then there's no reference of this in the New Testament whatsoever of someone drinking in this poison. And these are signs that to look for. You imagine Jesus saying, OK, these are the five main things I want you to look for to spot the, the genuine believers. Those who believe this will be following them. Watch this, um, you know. Uh, in my name, they'll cast out devils. Did did Peter do that in the book of Acts? Did Paul do that? Did, yes, they were casting out devils. They were doing all that. Um, they spoke with new tongues. Um, Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. Uh, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' household. Acts chapter 19, the disciples of John the Baptist. That They were speaking in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And then, you know, James White and others are like, well, they're holding snakes, <laughs> you know. Um, you go to some churches in America and they're holding snakes in their service. And it's like, really, um, I mean, the word serpent is in, it's in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, <laughs> all the way through. It talks about the serpent is the devil. And even in Luke, it says, um, I give you all power over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Just talking about spiritual, like demons. Not talking about literal snakes. And so th this is where I think it's disingenuous where some of these guys 
say, well, the last, you know, 12 verses of Mark, it has these Gnostic readings and like Dwayne Green was talking about the form of God, you know, he changed form and um, and also that they're picking up snakes and they're drinking poisons and what a, what a ridiculous reading. Uh, they're obviously just not thinking about these things properly and not applying the word of God to these um, verses. We're clearly it's saying um, they shall take up serpents. If you were just to read the Bible and go, what is the serpent? What is a serpent? It, it's a devil. Now, I understand Paul got bitten by a snake, but he it didn't affect him. And they, they started saying, well, he's a god or he's from God or whatever. But at the end of the day, I don't think that's even relative to this. I think he just got bitten by a snake because clearly serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy is not literal snakes. Okay, I live in a part of the world in Australia. We have snakes. We have lots of them. So oftentimes you'll just move a piece of wood or a piece of tin and, hey, there's a snake. You know, I've, I've touched snakes by accident that, that are um, meter, yeah, six meter long snakes. <laughs> I'm like, it, it's freaked me out. Their, their heads are like this. It's come out and tried to try to attack me. And, and But do I think I'm being attacked by the devil? No, there's a clear distinction between snakes in nature and a serpent that is in the Bible, serpents, scorpions, and all the power of the enemy, he's talking about devils, okay? So why all of a sudden would you put a literal snake in here unless you're actually just trying to downgrade the scriptures, unless you're just trying to, um, you're a critical text guy and you're coming against what the Bible says. And so, um, and it says, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. If you drink in death, if you become martyred, for your faith, you will be resurrected in a brand new body and um, you'll get a body of an angel. I, I've always wanted a body of an angel and um, I'm going to get one. That's going to be great. It says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Did that happen? In the book of Acts, Peter, he lay, laid hands on the sick, <clears throat> um, the dead, and they recovered. And so there's prob probably most people um, view like, casting out devils, speaking in tongues, laying hands on the sick. But usually it's take up serpents. People are like, oh, I'm not really sure about that. But understanding that that is a spiritual, basically, demons. And if they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. Um, understanding that, that that is related to martyrdom, as far as my study um, goes, when I read through that, these are signs that follow them that believe. Did these signs follow the early church? Did they cast out devils? Yes. Did they speak with new tongues? Yes. Did they take up serpents? Yes. In a sense of, you know, they're, they're going into a whole community, into Ephesus and just turning the whole world upside down and people are getting saved. They're routing the devil out of that whole region. You know, the people, there's, the people who are making idols are so upset. They're rioting, you know, so, so this is causing that the devil had a hundred percent control and now he's losing control of, of the area. Um, if they drink anything deadly, did, was martyrdom something that followed the early church? Yes. Um, did they lay hands on the sick and they recovered? Yes. So these are genuine signs that we should look for. So if you are a cessationist, you believe that these finished in, around about the, um, uh, the time. Some people say 70 AD. Some people say the end of the first century. Uh, I'm not a cessationist. And so I believe that these things are just still as re relevant as in the book of acts and so um that's why if i want to know who um who are genuine people i'm not saying you have to do these because there's been so much attack against all of these things just because someone isn't going around laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover i don't think well oh they're not a christian or anything but the thing is usually after years and years of study you go through it and you're like, actually, the Bible doesn't speak against healing. Like, I don't know anywhere in the Bible where it says healing stopped at all. But it just seems like if a denomination says, well, it stopped, we don't do that anymore, we have to go, oh, okay, that's that's biblical then. I'd rather just stick with the Word of God where it says um, they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Um, even Martin Luther, one day in the Lutheran calendar is this verse where it says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And it's only that part of the verse as well. And so um, understanding that if you read the book, The Cradle King, <clears throat> it's interesting, The Cradle King, King James, 
he prayed for 120 people one day and they were healed. He used to regularly pray for the sick. It was quite a normal thing in, in Christianity to just pray for people, pray for the sick and things like that. And what I see is when people are drawing denominational lines and doctrinal lines that they, they make a strict stand against this and it's like, what about Benny Hinn? You know, it's like, it's just like saying, what about Ruckman with the King James issue? It's like, what about Benny Hinn? And what about these other jokers? And it's like, well, like I said, around any type of truth, there's going to be 20 jokers there. And you've just got to break through it. And you're going to be stigmatized. People are going to look at you and say, oh, you're promoting them or whatever. But at the end of the day, I'm just following scripture. I can't find, if you can show me a verse that says healing and stop, I'll, I'll obey it. Show me, please show me. And I'll, I'll stop praying for people. But the amazing thing is some people who would debate with me on Facebook and all the rest of it, no, you, you can't pray for anyone to be healed anymore. When their wife is sick, when their mother-in-law is about to die, when uh, all these Facebook posts, can you guys pray? Um, well, the thing is some people actually teach that God puts the sickness on people. Now, I, I think that's uh, that's not good. It's not good teaching. Um, if God, usually if God um, has, if, if someone's died like Ananias and Sapphira, they die, they're, they're dead. But some people that they've got like a, you know, a sickness or whatever, it's like, oh, God's putting me through this trial. God's doing this. God's, God's doing that. The Bible says Jesus went about um, doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. And so it basically says that if you um, got any type of sickness, it's from the devil. So it's quite interesting. That's in the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38, I'm pretty sure. So anyway, I didn't really plan on going into that, but um, because our friend Wayne, uh, Gwayne, <laughs> Gwayne Dwayne, Dwayne Green, that's a bit of slistexia, um, is, does believe um, he's a continuationist. Uh, I thought I'd just mention a few things there. So let's just move on a little bit. So we've got... Um, I'll just call you Mr. Sam. Who is in heaven is a great verse that speaks to the omniscience of Christ. The modern versions remove it. Yes, it's a very important verse because the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places with Christ, okay, at right now. So if you're born again, in the spirit, you're seated with Christ. You have authority over the devil. You, you have dominion, you have power, you have all. Authority. So Jesus, um, he said in, um, let me just grab it in Matthew 28. <clears throat> Great verse. Um, all right, King James Version, because some of them do change it. Matthew 28 says, um, all, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he has all power. Okay, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the, of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So great verse. There's so much here that I could pull apart, like all power. Um, the Bible says, um, I'll look up uh, serpents and scorpions. Oops. Serpent scorpions. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Okay, so we have dominion and power over all the serpents, over all the scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Okay, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Most Christians read this verse and say, Behold, you have no power to tread on serpents and scorpions and or over any of the power of the enemy and everything will hurt you. <laughs> that, that's what I discover when I'm talking to Christians. A lot of them don't know their authority that they have in Christ. Basically, in Christ, you are like an SAS soldier in the spirit. So you, you can imagine an SAS soldier. He's got his gun. He's got knives. He's trained in, in combat. The devil has been completely stripped of all his power. You know, he might have a tiny little bamboo stick there and he's just to threaten people, but he's all bluff. You have all the power. You have all dominion. You have all authority. When you walk into a room, 
if someone is there and they have demons, they they can't the devil can't even recognize who you are. The Bible says that we are in Christ, so that all the the devils just see Jesus walked into the room. Because the Bible says we are his hands and his feet. When you look in the mirror in the spirit, it's Christ looking back at you. When you breathe in, Jesus breathes out. You and Jesus have become one flesh. Now, if I was to talk about a marriage and say, okay, you and your wife, you're one flesh. You know, uh, God looks down. He doesn't see two anymore. He sees one, all that sort of stuff. Well, that's exactly what's happened when you become born again. When you become born again, you and Jesus become one. Now, if you were to marry a multi-billionaire, if they were to move into your house, well, it's not long before you know, they go, well, let's let's get a new car. Let's get a boat. Let's let's do an extension on this house. Let's let's make it better. Let's move out of this house completely and go to a mansion. You know, your life's going to be changed. And so this is what happens when you um, become married to Christ. Whatever, all the good things he has become yours. If he's righteous, you become the righteousness of God. Uh, he is the light of the world. The Bible says in uh, Matthew, it says, you are the light of the world. That if you look at all the characteristics of Jesus, when he was you know, on earth, all those characteristics are you. Because you and Jesus, basically God the Father looked down and said, okay, we're going to have to sort this mess out. Um, you know, And Jesus is in 100% agreement in, in the Trinity. And they're saying, okay, well, I'm going to, Jesus is like, well, I'm going to die on the cross and set them free from their sins. And the Father's like, you know what? I think it'll be great to make all the people who believe in that just like you, Jesus. They're going to be exactly like you. So what happens is when you become born again, you adopt the nature of Christ. That's why when the when God the Father looks down on you, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay. So God the Father sees you. He looks down and he doesn't see you anymore. He sees Jesus. Every time you know, God saw Jesus, you know, the father at the baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, you notice that this was before Jesus's ministry. Now, he might have turned water into wine, which is grape juice. He might have turned water into grape juice, but he hadn't done any you know, miracles of healing and all this other stuff. His ministry hadn't started, but God the father was well pleased with him. It's because it's who he is. He is the son of God. He is righteous. He is holy. It's who he is. Okay. So when you become born again, it's not about your performance. God, the father looks down on you and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, if you go off and do a crusade in Africa and China and, and Europe, and you see you know, 10,000 people get saved. When you jumped on the plane to go there, God, the father said, hey, that's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When you got off the plane and you've done all these good works and everything, God the Father goes, hey, there's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 100%. Both times. Before you did the works and after you did the works. Works, they don't affect your relationship with God the Father. So God the Father is well pleased with us. When we are born again, he looks down and sees Christ. Now, when the devil looks at you, he doesn't recognize who you are. The Bible says we are hidden in Christ. So the devil looks at you. He just fears. He's afraid of you, and he runs the other way. And so a lot of people think, oh, the devil, you know, he knows who I am and all the rest of it. And I was sharing this the other day, but it's worth repeating just now, where when um, Herod, he got all the religious people together, um, when the wise men came and said, well, you know, we've seen the star in the east and we've come to worship the king of the Jews, and here's Herod as a king. He's like, who's this new guy, you know? So he gets all the religious people. It's like, where is this guy going to be born? You know, And so they work it all out. They do all the math. Um, Herod sends his soldiers in. They kill a bunch of kids. But where's Jesus? He's down in Egypt. So all the religious people, the political people, um, who found him? The wise men. Who found him? The, you know, the shepherds. You know, But at the end of the day, um, the devil isn't that smart, is he? The devil didn't. The devil's killing, you know, Herod, Herod's obviously demon possessed to do what he did. And he's killing all these children. And it's like, it, it's not working. Now, it shows how dumb the devil is. The devil is actually really stupid. We give him too much. Um, like, I understand he's a highly intelligent being. But when it comes to him messing with the things of God and the people of God, 
uh, he is actually clumsy and it's all bluff. And when you look at Pharaoh, he is killing the, the children. There's a promised, um, you know, savior, a Messiah type figure called Moses. He's going to come on the scene. And so he's killing all these little children in Egypt who are Jewish. So he's killing them, killing them. And so, but where is Moses? He's growing up in Pharaoh's house. How dumb is the devil? <laughs> you know what I mean? He's growing up in his house. And he eventually comes back and, you know, lets the people go. So um, the thing is, the devil's not that smart, is he? Or else the devil could have just said to Pharaoh, hey, this is the one. You know, stab him now. He's in your house, you know. And I'm sure Pharaoh just probably would have done that if um, he realized that that was going to be the chosen one sort of thing. Because he was already killing, you know, all the, all the children everywhere else anyway. I don't think he would have just stopped at that. But um, it just shows that the devil is not as smart as um, we give him um, credit for. And the devil is, um, we, we are hidden in Christ. When the devil looks at you, he only sees Jesus. And he's afraid. Because in the spirit, the devil is like a criminal, Okay. So we know late at night, criminals, they're going around trying to break into cars, jumping fences, looking at things to steal, you know, doing drugs, or, you know, getting getting smashed and bashing people and doing all sorts of things. So that's like what the devil does. He goes around just doing these misdemeanors. We are like full SWAT, you know, we're like SAS. So when a criminal sees like the cops, what do they do? They run because <laughs> they know these cops will just get in their cars. They'll run them down. They'll tase them. You know, um, I, it depends what country you're in. <laughs> Some places it's just like, no, you've got your rights, you know, and all this. But, you know, they'll, they'll in, a, in a proper policing situation, you have dominion. So you're like a police officer in the spirit. You have dominion. You have power. You have authority. Listen to this first. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, all the power of the enemy. What, some of the power? No, all the power. See, a lot of Christians don't realize we have total authority over the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So, you know, if we're walking along, we're like full on Bruce Lee in the spirit or something like that. No, who's going to touch you? you? You just, any devil comes your way. You're just like, Wah! And he's gone. And um, you have dominion. You walk in that dominion in Christ. You don't fear the devil. It's not like the devil's just all over you all the time and attacking you and things like that. The, the devil is probably not even around you. That's what I've found. Like some people are like, oh, you know, the devil's everywhere. And you open a cupboard and I get the chills. And it's like, mm, yeah, you've probably been watching too many Freddy Krueger movies when you, when you were a little kid. Um, you know, some people just have natural fears and things like that. Most of the time, the devil's not there. The devil's out bothering people. Um, he, you know, what, yes, he wants you to fall. Yes, he wants you to have a bad testimony and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, um, he's not going to hang around the born-again Christians. Uh, now, sometimes he will possess people to come into your circle to try and disrupt and false prophets and all that sort of stuff. We understand that. So usually it comes in human form. The, the, the devil will be possessed in a human and that, that will come into your church service and try to disrupt, try to cause division, teach heresy. Um, and so you've got to be aware of that. But at the end of the day, I don't think that the devil's there, like, you know, hiding your car keys or, you know, your fridge stops working and you're casting the devils out of your fridge or you're praying over your car, you know, um, no, it, it's, you're praying the car demons out and all that sort of stuff. It's just life. We're in a fallen world. And we have also our mind, where the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to do That's our job. We have to do that. It's not like we can just pray and say, God, transform my mind. He says in the word of God, your spirit is 100% perfect. It's matched up with the perfect spirit of Christ. But your soul is not. And that's your mind, your will, and your emotions. And you have to work on that. And that's by memorizing scripture doing the word of God. The Bible says, if you know the word of God and you don't do it, you deceive yourself. Jesus said, um, you will know the will of God um, by doing it. It's in the uh, gospel of John. And so you're know, doing the will of God, doing, obeying what Jesus says. It helps you, it helps you have correct doctrine and, um, and also knowing who you are in Christ. 
okay so this is one of the biggest things a lot of people don't know who they are in christ now if you were um part of an elite um military unit sometimes you'd have to remind yourself of that you know i, I remember uh some of my friends we used to be pretty you know think we were pretty tough back in the day and you know we, we would always try to you know um stand up for ourselves in fights but you know when you when you're young and um, you know, 15 and you've got 20 year olds who want to kill you, want to bash you, want to stab you. you. You can be on the run, you know. And so we had those sort of sort of issues. But years later, you you sort of grow up and you're like, who were those guys? And I, I, I'd i see them and go, that guy? I was afraid of that guy. You know, it, it, it's quite funny. But, um, I, you know, some of my really good friends, they were, one of them said that they were, they were in a car. And the, these guys have... Um, they were you know, born again Christians and they sort of have left the faith in a sense where they're no longer you know, following God and all the rest of it. And so they're going through the same old place where that, you know, used to live and grew up and everything like that. And there was um, some young guys sort of hooning in their car up behind them. And one of them just said to the other, we're bad. We're bad people. Let's get, let's get out of the car and smash these people and it was like yeah yeah well, you know why be all in fear sometimes you just got to remind yourself hey you're the bad dude here you're the you're the one who's going to take authority here they got out of the car walked up to the car and all these little kids are like oh we're really sorry we're sorry about all this and it's like um sometimes you've got to remind yourself who you are <laughs> you're, you're the you know if you're like a bruce lee a conor mcgregor or whoever you, you've got to remind yourself sometimes you know, hey you know slap yourself in the face of it and go hey you know, I'm the gladiator here. I'm going to win this. I'm, you got to remind yourself, I've got all power. I've got all dominion. I've got all authority here. When I turn up, Jesus turns up with me. When I, wherever I put my foot, it's the dominion and power of Jesus Christ goes with me. If my foot lands in Pakistan, I have the dominion of Christ with me. No devil can just overtake me. No devil can overrun me. No, uh, no man can snatch me out of the Father's hand. I'm with Christ. My hands and my feet are the hands and feet of Christ. I breathe in. He breathes out. If I'm standing before an audience, I, I, I just go, well, I'm just a, a cup, a, an empty cup, then it's filled with Christ. And I just remind myself of that. I breathe in. He breathes out. He is going to give me words. And the Bible says clearly, even when you're in times of persecution, um, that the Holy Spirit will give you words that no man will be able to contradict and things like that. So the, God can just move through you powerfully. But it, it, sometimes it's just reminding yourself of who you are. Because if you're an elite uh, in, in, in the military and you're a, an elite unit, sometimes you have to remind the guys, hey, guys, remember, we're the best in the world. We have the best weapons. We have a helicopter you know, flying in the sky ready to come in at any moment. We have the Air Force behind us. We have the Navy behind us. We have the whole American military behind us. We're going to go into this place and we're going to take this place and we, we rule. They don't, you know, sort of thing. You've got to remind yourself of that because you can let fear creep in and just become, you know, just a person who's existing until you die. Now, heaven's a great reward. But it's like, you know, we don't want to just exist, you know, and none of us do. We, we all want to make a difference in this life. And so understanding that all power, now if I, if I had all the money, if I went to your hometown, I went to all the businesses, all the banks, every person, and I took all of their money and I had it in a big pile. Well, how much does that town have? Well, they have no money left. There's zero money because I have it all, Okay. So when Jesus takes the power from Satan, how much power does Satan have? Zero. He has no power, no authority, no dominion. Because Christ has it all. He has everything. And so, and what's amazing is he says in um, Matthew, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All power. Therefore, go and teach all nations. And so this is because we are in Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ. We inherit whatever Jesus has. And so, you know, if you are married, you know, Bill Gates is usually a good example, but probably not <laughs> since all the vaccine stuff. But, you know, someone with massive wealth like that, you marry them, usually you get to spend their money. 
if you marry Jesus, you get what he's got. He's got all dominion. He's got all power. He's got all authority. The devil, when he tempted Jesus, said, um, if you are the son of God, you know, command these stones to be bred. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. If you are the, he kept questioning his identity. You've got to settle your identity and who you are in Christ. Because if you don't know who you are, if you don't know that you, in the spirit, you are like an SAS soldier, you're like the authority, you're the police, and the devils run like rats um, from you. You've you've got to you got to know that because or else you're going to walk in defeat. And so anyway, I thought I'd um, talk about those things. But great verse because it says we are seated in heavenly places. Um, Christ was seated in in heavenly places, um, John three thirteen, and we are also seated in, in heavenly places. And so uh, this verse by being removed not only attacks um, Christ's um, omnipresence. But it also attacks our position that we become like Christ. We're Christians, and our position is that we're seated in heavenly places. We have all dominion, all power, and all authority um, over the spiritual works of darkness. <clears throat> uh, he was on earth speaking these words, yet also simultaneously being in heaven. Yes, so this was in the spirit. So, um, Absolutely, because a, a lot of the time the Bible does talk about heaven being upward, but heaven is sort of also like a realm around us. It's a spiritual realm. You know, uh, we it's sort of like uh, in the, you know the w spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. You know, so um, you know Christ, he was uh, seated with the Father in heaven, but he was on earth as well, and so that's the exact position that we have as well. So. Joseph Armstrong's in the house saying, hey, hey, Joseph, uh, hell, you're saying hi all with a few little emojis. Um, Mr. Sam says, verses that are in question most times are pivotal, pivotal and vital points, speaking either to the deity of Christ and the doctrine of scripture and preservation. For example, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, Psalm 138, 2, etc. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I find that these people aren't just attacking those verses because King James people use them. They're, they're, they are actually quoting modern Bibles, which distort these verses and come against the doctrine of preservation, come against the doctrine of uh, the infallibility of Scripture and things like that. Mr. Sam says it's almost like the Word of God is being systematically attacked at key Christian teachings. Yes. And so we see that with Westcott and Hort. They had George Vance Smith working with them on the translation. And he wrote a book basically saying that um, this was in 1881 when the the Greek edition of the um, of the Bible had come out and they were, they were working also on the English edition. But George Van Smith, he was very happy that Westcott and Hort had changed verses like God was manifest in the flesh to he appeared in the body, that they'd taken out the comiohenium. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He was so glad that these are taken out because of doctrinal reasons. And so when people say, oh, there's no doctrinal significance, etc., cetera, um, I'll just show you George Vance Smith. So my website come come up first here. George Van Smith, so there he is, the Unitarians. The Unitarians are like Jehovah's Witnesses. So Westcott and Hort had him working on the Greek text. Um, you know, Smith said, only begotten God, where the RV revises only placed in the margin. He said, there is nothing at all unlikely in the supposition that this may be the true reading of this verse. So, you know, when you get James White defending the only begotten God or the unique God or however he wants to re-translate those words, uh, Monica Nace, he's agreeing with the Unitarian. And so um, basically what happened was George Van Smith, he came on the scene and Westcott and Hort had communion with him in the Church of England. And this was a huge upheaval. 
because here you've got it's like me inviting a jehovah's witness to your church and just saying you know he's fine we're doing a bible project together and everyone's like no he's not fine he's a unit he doesn't believe in the deity christ doesn't believe in the trinity he's a heretic you shouldn't be fellowshipping with this guy but they fellowship with him and um it just shows you the deep deep compromise of westcott hall so people are like oh people say westcott hall are blood-sucking vampires and all the rest of it what they're doing is they're exaggerating things because all you have to do is just look at the plain facts these were just deeply compromised individuals and so regardless of all the you know the ghostly guild and you know the seances and the vile textures receptors and all that sort of stuff at the end of the day you just have to look at george van smith and go why are they allowing a unitarian to touch the Bible, I wouldn't even allow a Unitarian to to read the Bible in a Bible study. <laughs> I, I would say, look, dude, unless you repent, we're not even going to fellowship with you. The Bible says, mark those who cause divisions and teach things contrary to what you've learned, and avoid them. That's very clear. Um, a lot of people need to do a study on separation. There are three people that we're supposed to separate from: from false prophets and teachers. Okay. False Christians, people who I'm a Christian and they're not, but also disobedient brethren. It says that in um, to the Church of uh, Thessaloniki, where they, it says those who do not obey this um, this letter have nothing to do with them that they may be ashamed. <laughs> so they just they're, they're actually Bible believing Christians, but they're not follow. I'm not going to follow the teachings of Paul. And it's like, well, okay, see, I'm, I, I can't have anything to do with you let alone so that's the that's the people who are brethren let alone false prophets and teachers benny hins the crafter dollars the you know all the other clowns you gotta you gotta stay away from them uh and from false christians if you know they're not a christian just don't hang around them don't just say sorry dude um but look at this <clears throat> george van smith published this in 1881 texts and margins of the revised new testament affecting theological doctrine briefly reviewed so this is one of the guys who worked on the text he's saying it affects theological doctrine that's the name of his book not just the concept the name of his book is text and margins of the revised new testament affecting theological doctrine but i thought no theological doctrines are affected <laughs> it's the exact title of his book <laughs> how's that you know dan wallace and james oh no doctrines are affected and usually you show doctrines that are affected and they're like oh no cardinal doctrine you know they narrow it down to like oh the trinity you can find that elsewhere you know yes they've deleted you know half of the verses but there's still the other half you know um and mark ward will say well you know the devil's not winning or um jonathan burris you know this verse appears in luke so the devil hasn't done a really good job has he well he's already got half of it out uh, Dwayne Green, this is an exceptionally interesting take on snakes and poison. Yeah, and so that's been my view probably for about 25 years now. Um, I was actually, there was a cessationist guy here in Australia, and he was telling me that um, yeah, God has finished with all that sort of stuff, and uh, I was in a cult because I believe that it continued, and he did, um, did a whole study into that, and um, it was 16 hours worth of tapes. So I listened to the whole lot, came to conclusions, <clears throat> studied it all through, and during that time came to that position. Um, it wasn't something that he was coming against or for. It was just because I was reading that verse so often. I was like, hang on, maybe there's more to this drinking poison thing. And it didn't seem like a sign that it was even mentioned in, in that the early church did. But when you understand that's martyrdom, um, yeah, interesting. So, Mr. Sam says, indeed, um, Bible version conspiracy doesn't uh, riddle use this passage to justify cessationism. Yes, so that's where we would be in disagreement. Um, so, I remember when he was debating James White, and so uh, Jeff Riddle sort of said, well, um, obviously, this is only for the apostles. And I was just, because I remember. Um, Actually, it's not that one. I've, I, I've got a, um, a book. I've given it to the Bible translator in uh, Pakistan. But it had uh, Spiros Zodhaiti. So he's done this one here. Oops. There's my water bottle. 
Uh, Spiros of Hay, he did the um, word study dictionary, okay? Um, so that's his name there, Spiros of Hay. He's, so this is a really good, interesting dictionary. It's not 100% accurate, but it's a very good try. And he had um, like a, basically a, an English Bible with the Strong's numbers above it. And in the end, he had his own sort of definitions. And sometimes he'd have footnotes. So at Mark 16, he had a footnote saying that this, um, in the Greek, it proved that it only applied to the apostles. And um, just like Dwayne Green um, was saying uh, in his recent video, that's that's sort of silly because then you've got Stephen. He was going around doing miracles and things like that. There are many people like Barnabas. He is considered an apostle. And so when you understand what's happened is people have redefined the term apostle. If you go through scripture, an apostle is just a job description, okay? An apostle in the Latin is missio. Missio is where we get our modern word missionary. So Paul, instead of saying Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, like the apostle Paul has arrived with his robes and with his gowns and everyone put rose petals in front of him and bow down because this is one of the apostles. No, it's just Paul an apostle. It's not even a title. It's a job description. I'm Paul and I'm an apostle. Basically, Paul, a missionary. And the, the concept of apostle, I know D.A. Carson doesn't believe in this, but um, in his um, uh, word fallacy book, I went through that and I was like, this is one of his examples. Um, but I, I just can't see it. He thinks that apostle is like that. They're the special class where I understand there is that sense where I believe the 24 elders, that half of them are the 12 apostles, but they're just elders who have gone before us. So um, they're sort of like the first Christians. But at the end of the day, Jesus said, call no one your master. We have one master uh, um, that's Christ and you're all brethren. So you're all equal. Now, some people might have more experience. They might be down the road a little bit more. They've gone and you know, done some things and you can learn from them. And so it's always good to learn from other Christians who are down the road a little bit. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> the uh, with the word apostle, we've put that in a special class. And so what's happened is um, usually the um, some cessationists are uh, like, well, those apostles, they're the special, you know, uh, we can understand the Anglican Church has this infatuation with, um, well, it's more so the Roman Catholic Church has this infatuation with the apostles and sometimes they chat to them like they do to Mary. <laughs> and it's like, no, don't talk to these people. They're dead. But then you see sometimes with the Anglican Church, they haven't moved that far away from it. And so sometimes they can have these type of concepts where oh, it, these apostles are, are uber special people instead of just being you know, brethren uh, that we can relate to and that they're on the same, you know, God looks down on them and goes, ah, there's my son in whom I'm well pleased, looks at you and goes, ah, there's my son in whom I'm well pleased, looks at, um, you know, someone who's just become a Christian 10 minutes ago, goes, ah, there's my son, all equal. We're all equal in Christ. And I'm not saying that there that doesn't mean like in a church there are people who have, you know, more, uh, sway more weight because of experience and things like that. But it was clearly Paul an apostle. It wasn't a title, the apostle Paul. And so, um, so basically, Spiros of Hades had that type of concept. He's like the apostles. They're the special people. They're the ones who had these gifts sort of thing. Where you just have to read through the book of Acts and it's like, nah, no, <laughs> there, there were so many other people with that. I mean, just look, there's 120 people the day of Pentecost. Um, speaking in tongues, Cornelius' household. Um, there's a whole bunch of people there. Um, there were at least 12 people um, when they ran into the disciples of John the Baptist. And so, you know, it, it just it doesn't fit. And um, so Jeff Riddle seemed to jump on that bandwagon too. And I, I was sort of like, no, that that's not. And he was sort of, I guess, appealing to James White because he's a cessationist too. And saying, can't you see that this verse actually has some good weight behind it for us to combat um, continuationism? And James White was just sort of like, no, nah, you know, it's a Gnostic text. <laughs> he went way overboard, but which, you know, sort of made Jeff Riddle just completely win the debate because, yeah, James White was like, well, no, we're, we're, these are Gnostic readings. But then he said, if they found some manuscripts you know, years later, 
that um, were like Vaticanus or Sinaiticus in their weight, and they had these verses in it, well, I would accept the readings. So, so in other words, James White would accept what he considers to be Gnostic readings. He would accept them as genuine if they found a manuscript somewhere. It was like, uh, you're sort of digging yourself into a hole here, James. Anyway, so it was interesting to watch. But, um, yeah, so uh, Jeff Riddle was basically using those verses, and a lot of people do. But... <clears throat> um, where was I going with that thought? And so, yes, yeah, Spirits of Hades. So, yeah, all you have to do is read the Book of Acts and you see a whole bunch of other people doing these things. Yeah, um, the casting out demons, speaking in tongues, da, 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 and they're not part of the apostles, okay? So what's happened in the uh, 20th century, there's been the movement among the um, what has been labelled Pentecostal movement. Now, I think a lot of it was um, was fanfare um hype um when you look at the azusa street movement see a lot of people go oh you you believe in healing you must enjoy the azusa street thing i'm like no nah, there was a lot of weird stuff of false teachings there was a lot of strange bizarre things i don't have to tie myself to any group to any group of people i just follow the word of god my my genealogical spirituality goes to the word of god and to jesus christ and the holy spirit i don't tie myself to any group to you know um to, to any tv guy or anything like that just like with the king james issues i don't have to tie myself to you know ruckman to ripplinger to anyone to jeff riddle to um da weight to any i can just go straight to the bible look at the facts myself and go well i figured that one out and so um what happened in the 20th century so the pentecostals came along and they've used that wrong definition of apostle and they've applied it to themselves saying well these apostles haven't faded away we are the super apostles we're the the anointed class and so that's where you get these benny hing guys um catherine coleman um william branham um kenneth copeland um uh what's his name uh kenneth hagan these type of guys are like well, we're apostles Okay, so when they're like, we're apostles, I'm in my mind, from the scriptural references, I'm like, okay, oh, okay, so you're a, you're a missionary, are you? And they're like, no, 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 I'm a special anointed apostle. And see, what they do as well is they they separate all the gifts of the spirit and say, well, you can have one little you know crumb and this other person can have a little crumb. Um, I've got the apostle one because that's pr probably the best one. And then they'll pray for you to get some more crumbs here and there. But the Bible actually says that the gift of the Holy Spirit is one thing. It says, stir up the gift singular that is in thee, uh, that was given to thee by the laying on of my hand. So um, Paul prayed for Timothy, and he got the Holy Spirit. And so um, this is very evident. That this, this is what they were doing in the book of Acts and everything like that. And so... But it says the gift, singular. Now, we divide it up to talk about it. So we, we it's like a pizza. Um, we have the one gift, and we divide it up and go, okay, healing, okay, word of faith, okay, word of knowledge, okay, uh, and prophecy. And, and we go around the circle, and there's, there's a whole bunch of gifts. And so what happens is a lot of people think that they only get one slice of the pizza, and that, it's like, well, that's my little precious gift. I'm, a, I'm an apostle, or that's my little gift, and I've, I... I give words of knowledge, or that's my gift, and I prophesy, or whatever. Now, we get all of the gifts. It's only in a church service that you wouldn't use all the gifts, okay? So if you're in a church service of 500 people and someone rolls in in a wheelchair, do you get everyone to run down the front and, and lay hands on them and pray for them? No. it's gonna They're going to freak out. You just get, you know, four or five people, hey, go and pray for this guy. And you could pick anyone. But obviously, you're going to pick people who have a few runs on the board. You know, you don't want to just pick some guy who's just you know, freaking out about it. Um, and so when it's talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's talking about in a church service when the body has come together. So you don't, are you all going to be, there's a church of 500, are they all going to prophesy? No, you'd be there forever. Are they all going to get up and preach? No. Are they all going to, um, you know, do this and do that? No they are all in their little place because they're in a church service. So when the body is all together, you don't 
you know, just have you know one greedy guy who does everything, you share that around. And so that's all it's talking about. It says you can all prophesy one by one that you can all learn. So you can all do it. You can all be prophets. Prophets. The Bible says in, in the last days, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, young men shall see visions. So it's it's pretty clear that um, this can happen. Um, and it, it's not making just a distinction. Not only apostles will do this and only you know, leaders will do that. And so anyway, I think that the, the whole movement um, of you know, what gets labeled as Pentecostal, I, you know, I don't I'd identify myself with that label whatsoever anymore. Um, just because there's so many, it's basically just been completely overrun with you know, heretical type of people. And um, I don't want to be associated with that. And I, I've been exposing Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland since the 90s. And I've been involved with discernment ministries that expose these type of people, Rodney Howard Brown, Toronto, blah, 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 Todd Benley. But I'm like, okay, what does the Bible say? Apart from all that, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says that you know, we're to trust in the word of God, we're to, to do what the Bible says, and we're to follow the teachings of Jesus. So I, I don't see anywhere where the Bible is... Um, saying that these these things are are completely gone so people are gone are saying okay well these things aren't completely gone and apostles what's the definition of apostle oh it's the main guru leader so then you've got all these pentecostal guys setting themselves up as guru leaders which is wrong where the bible says it's not a pyramid okay where you're at the top and everyone's below you it's an upside down period uh period pyramid where you are the servant of all. And so Jesus, when he was washing their feet, think about it, the King of Kings, Jehovah God himself in the flesh, God the Son is washing their feet. Probably, you know, Middle East and dust and manure and all sorts of things. And he's giving them a good foot wash because it was necessary in those days because they're, they're dusty roads, you know. Now we've got nice clean roads. We don't usually do that with, with our shoes. and But... He is saying, if you want to be the greatest, you need to be the servant of all. And so it's an upside down pyramid where we're usually taught that it's a pyramid. The, the apostle is at the top and then it goes down to, you know, these other little things right down to you. You're just a pleb, you know. And so the Bible does say in Ephesians, it says that there's this fivefold ministry. So what is that? Maybe I'll actually just touch on that since we've sort of got an open mic and we're just chatting and if anyone does want to join this stream and come on and chat um feel free to i'll put the i'll put the link up <clears throat> and so where was i going ephesians i think it's chapter four I'm going to put my fan up a little bit higher. It's going to be hot here. Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, so it says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Now, I'm, I'm just going to prove to you that we are all supposed to do these jobs. Okay? Because when you look at it, what... You would think, okay, evangelists, evangelists go out and preach to the people. They win the lost, you know, like a, a Billy Graham type of evangelist sort of thing. You know, Billy Graham was off the wall, by the way, but, um, you know, you, I'm just trying to put that picture into your mind, someone doing evangelism. But it says, for the perfecting of the saints, huh? an evangelist for the church doesn't make sense. If you have that type of con concept, Um an evangelist for the work of the ministry, an evangelist for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why would an evangelist be edifying the body of Christ? Well, I guess they're just going around preaching from church to church, you know. But <clears throat> when you understand that these are just things that every Christian can do, okay? So he gave some apostles. He gave some to be missionaries, okay? So these are to teach the church. So just say... Um, we had a missionary come from, you know, he's been in Africa for 10 years. 
he comes to your church, he's going to have a lot to say about being a missionary. And he's going to have firsthand information that will help you if you want to be a missionary. Okay, If you want to go and preach the gospel to a, to a town that's not yours, um, <clears throat> that will be helpful. So that's all it's saying is this person is, it's not a title, but it's an experience that he has that you probably um, don't have um, fully yet. So all the church is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's for everyone. It doesn't say, um, you know, only to the apostles. You go into all the world and preach the gospel. Everyone else just stay back and just relax and enjoy the show. And it says, and some prophets, well, it says you can all prophesy one by one and you can all learn. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 14. So we can all be prophets. Um, and so we can all be missionaries. We can all be prophets and some evangelists. So where to preach the good news evangelists just preach the good news and so um oh, is that only limited to just a pastor well obviously if you've been in the bible believing church for, for any stretch of time a good pastor will say we're all called to evangelize every single one of us it's not just you know special anointed class of people um and it says some pastors now this is where people will get their knickers in a knot because this is the only time where pastors appears in the New Testament. Now, it just means um, it's a Latin word for shepherd. But we all shepherd someone. A pastor of a church, he shepherds that church. But some people are Bible study leaders. They have, if you're in a church of 500 people and you have, you know, 10 different Bible studies, of course, they, there's going to be people who know those people better than the pastor. The pastor might not even know they come to the church, you know. And so a pastor is a shepherd. And so we all shepherd people. Some people are shepherding their just their, their family. Some people are shepherding, you know, certain um, people in their community, their, their, their parents, their, uh, their extended friends and things like that. And so you are an example for them. You're, you're to shepherd them. And so some people are over an entire congregation. But we're all called to shepherd. You know, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Is that just for Peter? No, it's for all of us. We're, we're to be, you know, looking for people who need, you know, oftentimes it's it's the grandpa. <clears throat> it's the father who's, you know, putting someone under their wing and, and guiding them and helping them that has you know, way more impact than just the, you know, the, the, the leader of the church, you know, because they don't have all that time to spend with that one person. They don't have access to that one person. And so we're all called to shepherd someone. So then you look at teachers, um, and I don't believe these are linked like pastors and teachers as in one, because some people say they're four for ministry. I believe this is five. So these are teachers. So we're all called to teach because the Bible um, just clearly said in uh, Matthew 28, it says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth, therefore go and teach all nations. So we're all to be teachers. Or do you think this doesn't apply to you? It only applies to the apostles. The, 12, the original 12 apostles. No, it applies to everyone. So <clears throat> what are these for then? So basically, someone like, say, Ray Comfort, he would be an evangelist. Now, there's some things I disagree with Ray Comfort's methodology, but if I was to get someone to come in like him into, into a church and teach on evangelism, that is teaching everyone to come up to this place where they're all evangelists. That would be the ideal. If an apostle comes, he's teaching them, hey, go out in all the world, preach the gospel. There's a harvest field in Africa, in Asia, over here, over there. Go, go and be missionaries. You know, I've done it. So it's just elders, people who are a bit down the road and they've got experience. The prophets, we can all prophesy one by one. So someone teaching on that. And um, the prophetic things are not just future. They are to do with professing the word of God properly. Some evangelists, so we talked about that, and some pastors. So, you know, how to shepherd people, how to be, um, you know, have uh, people underneath you who you influence, who you're a good example to, and, and the rest of it. And teachers, so we're all to teach. We're to go into all the world and teach all nations. Now, the, the New King James says make disciples of all nations. It's pretty hard to make a disciple because people have to make themselves a disciple. Okay, Jesus didn't just go to the 12 and just make them disciples. They had to submit to that. Look at Judas. He didn't submit to that. And so this, it's up to you to do it. So you can't make a disciple. You can never make a disciple. 
you you can teach them and they themselves submit to that teaching and make themselves a disciple so that's why i don't like the new king james reading there some churches are like you've got it where our thing is to make disciples make disciples and it's like um no you teach them you give them all the tools but it's up to them so anyway how long are we going to have so if we have a teacher come a missionary come uh prophet come evangelist ray comfort type of guy come What's this all this for? It says for the perfecting of the saints. So it's to help you in your Christian walk to be perfect. For the work of the ministry. So we're all the saints are to work in the ministry. We're all to minister to other people. For the edifying of the body of Christ. So we're edifying. We're, we're helping other Christians. We're helping them grow. We're, we're teaching them. We're guiding them. How long will we have these in our life? A pastor, a teacher, an apostle until we all come to the unity of the faith now usually when it's hot pistis it's talking about the faith which is the doctrines okay unity of the teachings it's not your own personal faith um that you have but it's your belief system till we come to uh till we all come to the unity of the faith so we're all basically speaking the same thing the scriptures and of the knowledge of the son of god so we come to the knowledge of jesus christ but isn't that interesting because we already know jesus we're born again already but do we really know jesus this is talking about a relational thing to the knowledge of the son of god and so knowing that you and christ are one knowing who you are in christ that's very important so a lot of people don't know that that's one of the things when i go around teaching i teach that people need to know who they are in christ <clears throat> unto a perfect man so you, you can be perfect <laughs> i remember there was a new convert well actually they weren't a new convert they've been involved with christianity for a while but they were sort of get, getting a taste of going out and witnessing and preaching and getting on fire for god and they're saying what's a good uh, facebook post to put up I said, and i said put on that you are perfect in christ <laughs> and they just got howls from people saying you're not perfect you know but the scripture says we're perfect obviously it's talking about in the spirit <clears throat> but listen to this unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ so we're to have these influences in our life until we all basically have the good doctrine and the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man and and basically until we look like jesus so the whole thing is to guide us so we look like christ and so that's where, where to have these in our life until this happens. That henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And so notice he's our head. We're the body. We're part of Christ. We are his hands and his feet. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. <clears throat> and so, um, interesting. So let's move on. We've got quite a lot of comments coming through. Okay, so I don't want to get too far behind. So Jeff Riddle um, sounds like a verse in second opinions. Um, so I'm, I've sort of missed where I, I guess perhaps we're talking about um, Jeff Riddle's um, opinion or spirits of Hades or James White and so yeah so that's where I would sort of say well yeah the book of Acts does say that there are people doing those type of things and they are not of the 12 so <clears throat> special signs were given to the apostles to confirm the word verse 20 yes and so um, it was also given to Stephen it was also given to Barnabas and pretty much anyone who wanted to enter into that the Bible says seek spiritual gifts so, um, and it says, seek the best gifts, um, but um, rather that you may prophesy. 
And so, oh, we've got Dwayne. He's here. Wow. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> yeah, good, mate. How are you? Look at that. I even got the camera set up and everything. The only thing is I was having trouble with my Bluetooth headset here. I got to actually cable in. Uh, so oh, yeah. I think I'm connected to another computer somewhere in the house, and it just I don't want to go find it. <laughs> That's good. I'm loving your haircut. Yeah, I am too. Yeah, you know what happened is uh, this is totally off topic, I'm sure, from what you're talking about. Uh, but I had this old buzzer, right? And I've had it since I was like a kid. And I usually go down to a, uh, an eight is an eighth inch. It's it's the number one on the the buzzer. Um, but I lost it, so now I was using a quarter inch. So now that it died, I finally bought another one, and now I just go down to the bottom. So I, it's easy. That's why I do it. Most of the stuff I do is because it's easy. <laughs> yeah, I've got a funny story with that. I was in a church for thirteen years, and. I left the church. It was a pretty big deal. And one of the main reasons I didn't go back for a couple of services was because I used to sort of um, buzz my head and it used to be like a, a number four or five and it looked fine. But yeah. the thing got stuck and um, it made a big chunk. And so I sort of actually had to shave my head with a razor. Then I looked oh, like I, um, I looked like an elf with my ears. And so I was embarrassed to go to church. So I didn't for two services. And the pastor sort of had announced that I backslidden or something. And I never went back to that church after 13 years. <laughs> and so that's funny. It was just one of those ev events that eventually I ended up, I was heading out the door anyway, but that sort of was the shove out the door. So, was, okay. Okay. Yeah. So a shaved head can make a, um, a difference in your life. That's <laughs> it sure can. You know, it's funny. Um, I was, I, I usually cut my, so we have four children, right? And our, our youngest son, uh, we we just buzz them because it's easier, right? Um, so with this old pair of clippers that I had, I was buzzing them down with the number two, and <laughs> the the little plastic clip fell off, and I took a chunk out of his head. Uh, poor kid had to go to school with his, you know, with a little <laughs> <laughs> poor guy. I it grew uh, out, it's all good, but anyway, yeah, toughened some up. Yeah, so you piqued my interest with all the continuationist, cessationist discussion. Um, so yeah, I've been uh, typing up a storm in your uh, <laughs> in your chat here. So much. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, to catch up. There's so much there. Um, maybe I'll yeah. just maybe if I can just read through like five. Um, sure. Because I I don't want to be unfair to these other guys. So Mr. Sam yeah. says I believe this speaks to cessation of these type of gifts. Okay, so that's Mr. Sam's position. He says, um, what's more important, though, is this passage has many important truths that are discarded by the modern versions in spite of my disagreement with the continuous on this. Yes, and so this also just affects, in the book of Acts, they did these things. And so mm -hmm. these were signs. So regardless of whether you think it stopped in, you know, 70 or 100 or it continues, it does affect um, the overflow after Matthew. And Bible version conspiracy says, what led to Mark 16, 9 to 20 being omitted? Or did the pages just fall off a copy? Yeah. Well, it's um, uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. They have the space for them. And James Snap Jr. has actually sort of worked out the size of the letterings. And he said that you can put the whole um, section back in, but they just basically got the space for it, but they don't have the words there. And so... Um, and he also says, do we think they were purposely omitted? Um, could be, but perhaps they, um, I mean, it just depends on whether you think uh, Sinaiticus is a modern day forgery or not. And so, um, you know, I think we're all, we're all believing in faith that, um, you know, this manuscript is either old or it's young, but most of us have no idea and we have to trust the, the gurus in the field. And so, until it's chemically tested, uh, we won't know that. Mm -hmm. But Dwayne Green says, my best theory yeah. is that Mark 16 is somehow lost in transit from Rome to Carthage and it's found its way to Egypt without the long ending. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah I can, I, you know what, can I share a screen here? Yeah, um, I've never tried, this will be really good because yeah. I do want to turn this um, into a debate channel and I don't know how to do all this stuff. So I think, yeah, I, I don't know how you would do that. <laughs> but if Maybe you... Maybe if I... Maybe audio. 
Oh, present. Here we go. I bet you that would work. Uh, slides, share screen. There we go. Uh, screen sharing is easiest with two monitors. Okay, yeah, I got two monitors here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, oh, look at that. Um, Windows, entire screen. Okay, there, there we go. Okay, I think. Ah, uh, yes. Add to stage. Oh, brilliant. Oh, Pretty look good. at that. Okay, well, let me see if I can edit this guy. Um, yeah, I got I got to work on some of this stuff too, right? So, um, it's it's so much easier to do the live streams. I I found. Yeah, um, I was making videos that were quite presentable, but then I just found if I actually just jump on, start chatting, and shoot from the hip. It's, yeah, yeah. It, it sort of comes out anyway, and people tended to like that a bit more. I'm not saying that the presentable um, videos um, don't have any weight or aren't important, but um, I enjoy doing the live stuff. You know, I'm just going to open this with paint. That'll be the easiest way to do it, I think. Uh... Do you have a Adobe? <clears throat> no, no. Yeah, it's quite expensive, but um, it is. It's really good um, for any oh, type of art. Okay, here we go. I use GIMP. Um, okay. the, the problem is, is the, the computer I'm using here for the live stream, it's just kind of like um, like a, the cheap cheapy, so it doesn't have a whole lot of memory. So Right, okay, yep. All right, let's see. All right, I think I think we can see that pretty good. Okay, so th so this this is part and parcel of my theory that, that I was mentioning in the comments. Here, let me just pull up the thing here. There we go. So, so this is a map of, of uh, basically the known world. This is, this is a map of the Roman Empire. Um, so it, is there a way to like see us on there? I, I can only see yeah. what's sharing it if we're not popped up on there. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so in, in the early centuries, um, there, there's an interesting article written. Um, I, I should have I should have kept the link, but it, it's written by Jeff Riddle about uh, it's it, it's about the Longinia Mark, and he goes through and provides some um, some details in there. And one of the things that he mentions in this article is that there are basically no disputes um, about the long ending of Mark until the third century. Now, I I kind of worked out a little theory here, and what it is is this: is if you take um, you know the, the the church history and you take tradition at face value, um, we have the Gospel of Mark being written somewhere in Rome, uh, so somewhere around here. Uh, now, what's really interesting is when you take a look at the earliest, you know, reference to Mark 16, 9 through 20, I, I think it's from uh, uh, Irenaeus, uh, somewhere in the 170s or 180s up here. Um, you also have uh, Tatian's Diatessaron, which he produced in Rome uh, around the same time, so again here. And then you have uh, Justin Martyr in Rome uh, showing uh, the long ending of Mark. And then over here in Caesarea in the 300s is when you see Eusebius um, talking about, you know, uh, all the Greek manuscripts and blah, blah, blah. And, and that's a total mis misinterpretation. I don't know if you saw the video I did on Eusebius's um, witness about that. I haven't um, seen that but, one yet. But yeah, so, so Eusebius, the quote that's often taken from him is this discussion he's having with uh, Marinus. And Marinus is asking a question. He's asking, you know, how come the ending in, in the book of Matthew, why, why does it say that Jesus' crucifixion was early on the Sabbath, but then in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16, it talks about it being late late on late in the day. So he, he was asking Eusebius basically how to reconcile the two. And so he Eusebius comes up with three three reasons to reconcile it. One is to just say, well, you could be as somebody who would cut it out of the text and say, uh, well, there's no Greek manuscripts which have this, and so um, we can just leave it all together. Um, but the important thing to recognize when Eusebius talks like that, he's not saying there are no Greek manuscripts. He's he's asking as someone um, who might say that, right, to answer Marinus's question. And then he goes on to give two other answers. One other answer was that, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, we're not going to bother try to reconcile it. That's just how God's word happens to be. And then the third one he gives, which is probably his best one, is, uh, having to do with punctuations. Um, but anyway, so that that has been, in my opinion, misconstrued to make Eusebius saying that there's no Greek manuscripts, when in reality, that's not what he's saying. Okay. And then just, and, yeah, and then Jerome, um, 
is often said, and again, this is probably closer to 400 now, right? That's right. Looks like looks like we're getting lost here. Yeah, that's fine. It just paused there for we are. about five seconds. That's fine. Yeah. So, so Jerome is said to have stated that there are no Greek manuscripts. Um, but I, if I'm not mistaken, he was actually quoting Eusebius, mm. um, which is interesting because you end up with the conundrum of Jerome saying that there's no manuscripts that have this, and yet he puts it in his in, in the Vulgate. Yeah. Uh, so, so that to me, that seems to answer that question: is he wasn't mm. actually saying there's no Greek manuscripts; he was re referencing Eusebius's work. Um, mm. Anyway, so coming back to to Rome uh, and and uh, um, France, uh, I, I don't know what France was called in the first century. It wasn't called France, I don't think. Um, uh, Gaul, I think. Gaul. That's right. Um, so anyway, so when we talk about Eusebius and we talk about Jerome. Uh, what we what we end up missing is the fact that Marinus is providing a witness for the long ending of Mark, right? Because he's he's writing to Eusebius saying, like, how do I solve this uh, conundrum? Now, Marinus, he founded a monastery in Italy, um, and he wrote these questions to Eusebius while he was here in Italy. Uh, so I'm not sure whereabouts in Italy. I think it was actually probably further north. Um, but anyway, you, you have this stacking effect where everybody that we know of, that we have read and seen from Italy, the 300s and before, have zero dispute about Mark 16, 9 through 20. Now, I know mm. some will say, well, that's an argument from silence, but like, what, what else are you supposed to do there? Um, mm. that there should be some semblance of, of a dispute happening in Rome about Mark 16, 9 through 20 if it's, if it's not original. So you have Mark writing in Rome, you have the church fathers, Justin Martyr, uh, Irenaeus, Tatian, um, Hippolytus actually in, Car in Carthage, I believe, or Hippo, Hippo, which is near mm -hmm. Carthage, I, th I think. Uh, but anyway, so you come up to the fifth century and what's happening in the fifth century is you have the Gothic versions somewhere up here, uh, which were translated by Wafala in, I think it was the three, three or four hundreds. Again, not a single Gothic manuscript that I'm aware of does not have the long ending or, mm. or all of them, as far as I know, have the long ending. So you have this picture here where everything North um, has no dispute about Mark 16, nine through 20. Mm. Now some will go, well, what about Codex Bobbiensis? Codex Bobbiensis, Lat Latin manuscript, you know, it's from the two fifties. It's gotta be from the two fifties and uh, it's, it's, it's in Italy and, and it only has the short ending. That's it. Uh, but then when you look at the history of Bobbians, uh, Codex Bobbians, it actually didn't end up in Bobbio, Italy until the 600s, so well after the initial period. Um, Bobbiensis is apparently founded, or somewhere, was potentially translated in Carthage. And because it has some kind of go back to um, Cyprian, um, people believe it's, uh, it, it's probably translated from a Cyprian source. Um, so... Mm -hmm. You take everything south of the Mediterranean and you come to Egypt in the 350s where you have Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and the rest of the papyrus manuscripts. Um, so so he, here's what could have happened, right? Since there's, there's no issues north of Italy, uh, nothing at all, right? Until like, you know, 6th or 7th century. Um, I suspect maybe, maybe there was a shipping route. And this, this is total conjecture at this point. Maybe there was a shipping route and something happened to the last page of the manuscript um, and, and it got and it fell off. And, you know, 16, 9 through 20 was probably that last page. Um, and then it gets propagated by Cyprian and makes its way south into Egypt. And then what gets really interesting is you have these sort of two streams, a north and a south stream of copying. One comes over north and they meet here. Well, I should say here. One comes south and meets up here. And what you get is the Syriac manuscripts, which have kind of a mixture between the two. You have the uh, Armenian manuscripts, which are about half and half. And then you have the Georgian manuscripts, which are essentially a copy from the Armenian manuscripts, according to James Snap. Um, so you can see the sort of northern track meets the southern track, and that's where all the confusion comes in. Um, mm. And you can see that happening here. And then, of course, the Byzantine Empire here. Uh, 
sees that and goes, oh, you know what? The long ending should be copied in all of our manuscripts. And then, of course, you get the Byzantine manuscripts here. Hmm. Anyway, so that, that's my theory <laughs> in a nutshell. Uh, I think it's really easy to see that. Yeah, that, that's really good. And I think, um, yeah, going through the geography like that is um, with the visual is, is yeah. really powerful because, um, yeah, some of these manuscripts, we know where they came from. Uh, some of these manuscripts, we know where they ended up. And so, um, but yeah, specifically the last um, 12 verses um, being the last page of a book, they could have just fallen off a manuscript that was being copied from. And, um, and so, you know, someone basically had to stop there and they left the space for it, but they wanted to make sure and they never got time to go back and um, redo that. So that could be the case with Vaticanus or Sinaiticus yeah. if it is ancient. It and, and it so, leaves a bit of conjecture. We can, we can conjecture a little bit too, right? And if you use this sort of thinking, um, especially with uh, Babiensis uh, coming from, uh, from, from the south of the Mediterranean, you go, well, what about the short ending? And you go, well, I think the guy who might have brought it over on a boat saw that um, the last page was lost. And so he just put something there because, you know, you don't end with Efobundogar, right? You don't end with they yeah. were afraid. Uh, yeah. So I... I mean, I, I don't have any proof of that specific scenario, but you could see how something like that could tie in. And that, that brings in, it makes sense of all the confusion surrounding Mark 16, 9 through, 9 through 20. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's good to um, to have a your own theory and then you're trying to back up your theory with the historical facts. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's just good to question everything. I think sure. that's that's the position of um, someone who's an academic. They, they need to question everything that's come down through Bruce Metzger, through um, Westcott and Hort, through um, Burgon, through everything, because um, we just see people, m most people don't do the homework. Um, and this is where I take my hat off to people like James Snap Jr. He's obviously mm -hmm. done a lot of work here, Maurice Robinson, and um, they've come up with um, a lot of really interesting conclusions. But basically, to sum it all up, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus are really the only two Greek manuscripts that don't have these words, in mm -hmm. a sense. And, um, and so this is really a death blow to the critical text because... Um, they oftentimes are saying they're following the text. They're using all the readings in the apparatus. So they've got all these readings at the bottom of the page, but they tend to ignore all those readings. And mm -hmm. um, the embarrassment of riches by having all these readings all around the world is just sort of thrown under the bus in favour of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus primacy. And so, um, which isn't really that far detached from what Westcott and Hort was doing. And so, yeah, yeah I'm, I, and I mean, I'm, I'm not sold on the idea that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are like the greatest manuscripts that we have. Um, I, I would be curious to see, though, what um, what a what a reason eclectic would say to that question. Like, what, what is it about these manuscripts that make you think um, that they're some of the most important um Manuscripts. Now, I, I had sent an email out to Dan Wallace back in like, oh, I don't know, 2012, when I started really getting into this discussion. Um, and I asked him, you know, what's the most important manuscript? And, and he sent back a single word email, just said Sinaiticus. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I'd like to see what the reason is behind why those two manuscripts specifically are seen as so important. So, um yeah yeah i yeah. go through my comments there yeah i think it was um yeah i'm just sort of showing the comments because sometimes they a lot of people don't watch the feed when they're watching the video but so i just put them all up in here so they can read them along if they watch it later but um yeah i i, I think that um yeah dan wallace and and co that they've and even uh, as you've pointed out, modern Bible versions in their footnotes have been quite deceptive or just 
um, uninformed about the facts about these verses. It just seems like a default position that they say, oh, some manuscripts this, and it's quite vague, where when they give the the actual count and it's like, well, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, they, they're the ones that don't have it. Pretty much, I think it's 1,637 or something it was James Snap's count, I think it is, that do have it. I do have right. a longer thing. It's a lot, and it's and it's everywhere. And um, you know, when you've got, uh, you know, when you've got that much evidence, you've really got to um, take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if you did. Did did you see the um, the marginal notes live stream? Yes. That, is that the one for, that went for about ten minutes? No, 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 no. I, I cut some of those out and then posted them because I know not everybody wants to watch the whole live stream. So um, in, in it, I was talking. So I have this this King James Bible. Now, you know, I'm not a King James version guy, right? I'm I, I'm, a, I'm a Byzantine priorist guy, but I, I see the TR as almost <laughs> almost the same. So I um, yeah. But uh, anyway, so you would probably find this more uh, interesting. I found it interesting about uh, the notes from uh, this Nelson study Bible. So this one, I, I bought this years ago, um, but in the footnote uh, to uh, Mark 16, nine through 11, um, I'll just pull it up here. <laughs> I was surprised to see this. It was like an admission in the footnotes. Uh, so I, I don't know who, who is putting together the notes in here, but it says this, I'll just read it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so it says, ancient manuscripts contain two different endings for Mark. While well, some suggest that Mark did indeed intend for his gospel to end at verse 8, it ends on a note of fear and lacks a clear resurrection account, right? So they obviously, that's good. They see that as uh, uh, problematic. But then it says, in light of the uncertainty attached to verse 9 through 20, it may be advised to take care in basing doctrine off of them, especially verses 16 to 18, <laughs> especially especially 16 to 18. Mm -hmm. He that believe in his baptized shall be saved, but he that believe, believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so like there's, there's an admission in, in the, uh, in the study portion uh, on the bottom of the page that says, this is a really important variant. And, mm -hmm. you know, you would be advised to take care if you're going to do any doctrine based off of this passage. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I was uh, I was actually kind of disappointed. I, I was expecting that the uh, you know the King James Version study notes would at least <laughs> not push that kind of issue with with the long ending. Yeah, it's um, it's actually a real shame because well, it's it's been interesting. Like say Matthew Everhard, he was sort of like I'm a critical text guy, but then he was like, but I do support the last twelve verses of Mark. I do support the women caught in adultery and. Hmm. I, I was saying, and a lot of other TR people were saying, you're actually majority text. You're not critical text. Because uh, if you followed those type of readings, um, you are definitely not following the critical text. Because they double bracket mm -hmm. these, which means yeah. there there is cert they are certainly not the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so if he's going bucking against that and saying, well, they are the word of God, there's 24 um, verses that he's adding, which is quite mm -hmm. a lot. There's a lot of words. Yeah. And so, yeah. well, he's a majority text guy now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he made the change. I like to think that I had a part in that, but uh, yeah, who knows? Yeah. But, and uh, I did some pretty harsh um, videos on him, but I think when it comes to the data, if he's to leave all the emotions out of it and just look at the facts and stats and figures, I think I gave him something to think about as well. Sure. And, um, yeah, and you know, at the end of the day, it's it's quite a huge chunk of scripture, and I think mm. it's um, it's a real shame that this generation has to put up with this type of nonsense in a sense where mm. um, you know you, you you're a new Christian, you just want to read the Bible, and you get to those places, and it says these verses. Sorry, they're they're not there. And I remember as a non Christian seeing those footnotes. And just thinking that these Christians don't know where the word of God is. They've got no idea. And just thinking that this is ridiculous. And 
like at the time, I, I didn't believe in Jesus or God or anything. I was a complete atheist, believed in evolution. And I, that would that could have been a place where I read through the scriptures and went, okay, there is a God. You know, Jesus is speaking to me. I got through Matthew 5 um, and it said these these words aren't there. They should be um, omitted or whatever. And I was like, these guys have no idea what their own Bible should say. And to me, just as a as a non Christian, I, I was just flabbergasted that these guys are claiming to have ultimate truth and everything, but they don't know ultimate truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and and so that was one of the reasons why I I didn't become a Christian for another year and a half after that um, right. event. And so, um, yeah, so even before I was a Christian, I, I was reading through some of these Bibles. I think it was an NIV Bible. Mm-hmm. And it just had all these footnotes, and I looked at it and just went, "This, these guys don't know where the words of God are." Yeah, like I, I'm starting to rethink um, whether footnotes in an English translation are good, uh, whether we should have them or not. Um, yeah, it, when when I talked about the marginal notes in the last video, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about while I was putting that material together um, was the whole idea of. The average person who reads the Bible, like, hey, I'm not, I'm not the average person who reads the Bible, right? I, I, I look at the original languages, I look at all the textual variants and stuff. You're, you're not an average person who reads the Bible, right? You look at all this stuff, and blah, blah, blah. But the average person who's, who's sitting in our church, for example, um, who's sitting there with their Bible open, they come across the textual note. Um, they, they would not be equipped um, to make any decisions based off that note. They wouldn't be equipped to even determine whether the note in the margin is good or whether the note in, or whether the text inside is, is fine. And, and of course, if I'm preaching a text and a point matters on one of these, I'm going to point out that and say, this is the right reading. That's the wrong one. Um, but yeah, so, so like the average reader doesn't know the languages um, who doesn't know anything about the manuscripts. Like what good is that note for them? Truly. Mm. Yeah. What, what are they going to do with it? Uh, e- even like some of them, I, I mean, I'm presented with them. And I go, well, like, how am I supposed to make a decision on this mm. note here? Like, I have to do 20 or 30 hours of digging to find out what's happening in the manuscript tradition and blah, blah, blah. And then even then, right? So so if it if a footnote is, I mean, it's good for me to know what the variant is um, to study. But for somebody who doesn't study that, what, what good is that note? Um, so, mm. yeah, it's it's got me thinking a little bit in regards to whether I should consider footnotes a good thing in the Bible or not. Yeah, I think for, for academic purposes, you know, having footnotes and variants and things are perfectly fine. But for the average person, like you're saying, like in the revised version, Dean Bergon pointed out that they had at um, Revelation um, chapter 13, they had the footnote 616. And at the time, they only had one manuscript that had that reading. So now, now it's two, I, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> it's two now. But they actually put it as a an alternative type of reading in the margin. And he was saying, why, like this Dean John William Burgon, he was saying, why are they doing this? Is This is just causing problems. Um, they're putting these type of things in the margin, just like with the um, 1952 edition of the Revised Standard Version uh, that mm-hmm. Bruce Metzger worked on. They had in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16, that some manuscripts say that um, they basically said that uh, the father of Jesus, talking about Joseph. Yeah. And, um, so someone did the research into that, and it was one Syriac manuscript. It wasn't even a Greek manuscript. And so um, and it had the reading basically coming against and attacking the virgin birth by basically making Joseph... Uh, Jesus's father, and yeah, that, it, it makes you wonder. That would be a conjectural emendation, right? If they're not basing it off of a Greek manuscript, if they're basing it off of uh, a Syriac, because we we see that in uh, is it Second Peter three ten? They did the same thing. It's just a Syriac manuscript yeah. which has the not, the not in there, right? And so yeah. they, it's a conjecture to put that in. Yeah, and so that was wild. Did, it was just in the margin. Um, of that, but it, it's like, why have a marginal note with that reading that basically comes at, and attacks the virgin birth 
why have it there? <laughs> what who's who, yeah. who have they got that that there for? For the general population, so they can <clears throat> basically doubt that uh, the virgin birth, you know. And so, yeah, yeah. I I don't touch the RSV. I don't recommend it. I especially the updated edition. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I what I don't understand, I, and this is part of my my like uh, unhappiness with with the current critical text methodologies, is I I would never I would never invite Jennifer Knust into my church to preach, right? Uh, for a number yeah. of reasons, right? <laughs> but I, I would never I would never invite that I, I would never invite Bart Ehrman into my church to preach, never, mm. never. So uh, why are they? Uh, handling the word of God for the church. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's like they're, they're, they're working with the, the text of scripture that, that I'm preaching from, even though I would never have them preach in our church. So, um, I mean, yeah, I, I, as far as I understand, Bart Ehrman's work was very limited, um, but I'd be curious as to like his influence generally in text criticism. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't understand why, like here's here's another one. Uh, they're doing some work on the Old Testament. Now I, I don't do much Old Testament textual criticism. I, I'm aware of some of the issues there, but I've just chose not to to go into it. Um, but I'm aware they're doing an update to the Codex. Uh, what is it? The the Westminster Leningrad Codex. That's the yes. the electronic one. Hmm. And there's a more there's a Mormon there's a Mormon yeah. on the committee. Yeah. And I'm thinking like I would never have a Mormon in my church preaching right. Yeah. So why why is this person why is this Mormon non Christian you know believes he's going to be God one day and have his own planet right why <laughs> is he why is he working on the Old Testament that that is expected for us Bible believing Christians to use <laughs> so I, I I don't understand and and that was one of the main things like with the Textual Confidence Collective. I know that there are some people out there on the fringes of what's labeled, you know, King James only. And they might have said, you know, that Westcott and Hort are blood sucking vampires and, you know, made up stuff about Westcott and Hort. But at the end of the day, they, their fellowship with George Van Smith, Unitarian, their defense of him and their them allowing him to have communion when he's a Unitarian, doesn't believe in the deity of Christ, doesn't believe in the Trinity. And he's working on the Bible, sitting next to Westcott, mm. sitting next to Hort, sitting next to Scrivener, working on this text. It's like, why have you got this guy there? You know, surely yeah. you can find other people who are scholars who just have correct doctrine. Because if you can't have correct doctrine, how can you trust that they're going to have, you know, the correct understanding of Scripture? Right, because, right. Um, Jesus is pretty clear on that. You know, if you... Um, if you do the will of God, you will know correct doctrine. It says that, I think it's in John chapter 8. It's around there where he's arguing okay. with the Jewish crew. And if you um, do the will of God, you will know correct doctrine. And so uh, obviously this guy, he has poor doctrine, bad doctrine. He doesn't believe, he's heretical. The Bible says separate from heretics. Mm -hmm. um, he's just like a Jehovah's Witness, basically. And to have a, him on the Westcott and Hort committee, it doesn't matter, you know, if we can prove that um, Westcott and Hort, Hort weren't blood-sucking vampires, um, we can just point to George Van Smith and say, who, what, what, what's the go with this right. guy? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I don't, I, it just, I would never have him come into my church to preach yeah. a message and to teach my, you know, my, my congregants. Why, why are we allowing this guy to work on the new Testament? I, I, I don't know. I, it just, it's one of those um, uh, contradictions. Um, and, and I understand that there are, you know, brothers in, in, in the field of textual criticism and so on and so forth. I, I get that. Um, but I just, I, I can't overlook that. I, it's hard yeah. to, so yeah and and i think too um like with the nestle alarm text um you know with carlo martini you know he was a jesuit guy open mm -hmm. jesuit um even bruce metzger and, and kurt Aylen, they were very liberal and very compromised you know they had meetings with the pope with the 
uh, leaders of the Greek Orthodox Church, basically saying we're we're all part of we're all representatives of Christianity, and we now we all have the same Bible. He they said that in 1972, and you just see this deep compromise, the ecumenical movement um, that is spread throughout Christianity. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about you, but here in our town, if you want to be a pastor here, you're expected to go to a thing called the Minister's Fraternal. Mm. And they monthly get together and you'll sit there with a the Seventh-day Adventist pastor, uh, the the homosexual Anglican pastor. Um, mm. You'll sit next to the Roman Catholic priest. You'll sit next to uh, you know someone who's into bizarre, you know, uh, Benny Hinn type of stuff. And you all basically say that we're all saved and you have to really compromise with these guys. Right. And um, that, that ecumenical movement seems to be rife in the, um, the Bible um, translation or, or the, the, the critical text movement. There just seems to be so much compromise there with a lot of these questionable characters that um, I think when, when I saw Mark Ward and Timothy Berg trying to defend Westcott and Horde, I was like, guys, you really, really, it's almost mm. indefensible. How, how can you defend against this? You know? Right. Yeah. Now I, now, I haven't read entirely everything from Westcott and Hort. Um, I did do a little digging into the whole ghostly guild thing. Um, and I remember, I, I, I think I was going to do a video on it or something. Um, I got notes somewhere. Uh, but I remember looking at that and actually coming away rather underwhelmed uh, with, with the evidence. It, it seemed to me, and maybe maybe this is where we'll disagree a little bit, is they, they were kind of coming off as these sort of, you know, dumb kids in their 20s just doing something because it seemed kind of interesting. Um, because from what I see, uh, it doesn't look like they did much else after like a couple of these um, newspapers were run uh, mm-hmm. with with some of the stories they had collected. Um, it, it doesn't look like anything else happened after they finished their time in uh, was it Oxford or Cambridge? Can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we don't hear about the go- the ghostly guild anymore. Now I, I know David Sorensen. Uh, he did some uh, digging into the Ghostly Guild as well and came came forward with a bunch of stuff. Um, but I, I didn't see um, I, I didn't see any explicit reference to to Westcott and Hort and their continued work in the Ghostly Guild. Um, so I, 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 I don't think the Ghostly Guild was necessarily as bad as it's been made out to be. Um, but again, I could be wrong. So yeah. Um, that was one of the things that in my um, videos about the Textual Confidence Collective, I was basically just saying, look, regardless of whether they proved that these were you know, big seances, they were talking to the dead or they were levitating off the ground or you know, whatever. <coughs> yeah. it's like, regardless of all that, they've got George Van Smith on their committee. Right, and right. They're hanging around this guy for years and years. He's deeply compromised. He's a heretic. Uh, mm-hmm. And they're having communion with him in the Church of England, which caused a massive upheaval right. in the Church of England. And so, like, it's like if, if if I was to do a Bible translation and I was to invite a Jehovah's Witness on board, uh, right. we would go, hang on, there's something wrong. You'd be like, there. what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. but so, um, Are you saying that a Jehovah's Witness was helping you with the KJV 2023? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd just invite them around and they would um yeah they would come and help me with that and so how, how did you translate apostasia in there uh as falling away okay okay yeah because you you were doing some discussion on one of your eschatology videos and you were suggesting that and i think this was around the time when i had uh, alan uh kirshner on mm. uh you were suggesting that that apostasia was not necessarily a falling away but a departure um, so t- tell me a bit about that, because that seems to contradict your King James Version view. Yeah, so w- I guess what I was saying was it's defined as that. So some words <laughs> like we have to define, like, say, the word Easter, which we all know, you know, some people yeah. define that as Ishtar, um, the pagan goddess, and even James White got caught up in that. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of King James guys got caught up in that, and so I, I was caught up in that too, and I think we all were. Mm-hmm. Um, to a certain degree. So just defining the word, sometimes you have to sort of go and have other examples. And so in the Geneva Bible, it just says departure. And right. so um, understanding that the falling away 
if from a perspective, if just say we're here right now, yeah, and um, we get raptured up, then then someone comes to your house and they're like, "Where's Where's Nick gone? Where's Dwayne gone?" They've right. fallen away from them. We we would use that type of language in a sense of someone's fallen away from our company or fallen away from a church, like they've departed from our uh, midst. Right. So it's coming coming from the angle of those who are left behind, because that's what the church in Second um, Thessalonians it was seen that they had been um, they'd missed sort of this whole thing. But um, so Paul's saying, well, there's got to be a falling away first. So from your perspective, if you're in the tribulation period, there's got to yeah. be a departure happen first. There's got to be a falling away of all the Christians first. And so right. um, so that it's coming from that perspective, not so much. It's sort of the, the opposite side of the coin of Harpezo. Harpezo is we are, uh, that are alive and remain are caught up. Right. So we're snatched away. We're sort of kidnapped to, to Jesus. Where if someone was kidnapped um, it, from our midst, we would say well, they've fallen away. They've they've gone away from standing. And mm -hmm. so um, and that's when I did the research into Alan Kirshner's video on this. Um, that he he does a video with about four or five other pastors. The um, seven pre-trib problems. Yes, and yeah, so, yeah. Um, and he, he, so that's Chris White. He just did the one saved, always saved. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because I know there's a lot of chatter about that, and I really have to um, look at that. But one thing I found with Alan Kirshner's material is that he um, he basically claimed that the Septuagint that never says that it's a spatial departure using the word apostasia. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I did find that he actually misquoted the um, Septuagint. And I don't think he did it on purpose because right. other people had done this as well. But there is um, a king who grabbed all the vessels of God. He took them out of the temple. So that's a mm -hmm. spatial departure and it calls that an apostasia. And so, and then uh, they, were brought okay. back in, they were brought back into the temple. And so um, I do talk about that on my website so i might even actually just quickly get this up um but i did do a quite a extensive study into this and I, I i until i did this study i was just convinced that a falling away was a, a departure from the faith right but i found that i had to actually add the words the faith there um or the great falling away there was quite a lot of baggage right. around around that and because most people in the Reformation period believed that the Antichrist was the Pope, um, and right. they were they were using this type of terminology, the Great Falling Away, as like uh, something to do with the faith. But if you just translate it um, normally, it's just a falling away, which a which is a general departure. And so, I'll, where is that again? Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two. And uh, verse eight? three. Three. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> I got I brought my King James version just for you. Oh <laughs> I I feel warm and fuzzy. So so usually some of the there's four different ways that people read this. The great falling away, the falling away the falling away from the faith or the great falling away from the faith. So usually when people are talking about this, that's the type of language they use. So apostasia is used in Acts chapter 21, 21 for um, the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought to circumcise their children. So they were saying, Paul, you're preaching that people should forsake Moses. Now, obviously, that's the doctrines that Moses was teaching, the, the laws in the Torah. Um, but it does use the word forsake, and so right. Um, we can see uh, other versions, like say Tyndale has a departing first, Coverdale a mm -hmm. departing, Matthew a departing, Great Bible a departing. So it's basically the Bishop's Bible had falling away, but you wouldn't see that as being um, different from departing. So right. it just means. 
the apostasy just means you've you've gone away from standing. So if it's in the context of doctrine, you've gone away from uh, your your doctrinal stance. Right. But if but this verse doesn't speak anything about doctrine. And so um, so what I found with the non-spatial noun that was being talked about by um, Alan Kirshner, it has, I'm just trying to find that reading. Yeah, here in um, 2 Chronicles 29, 19, it says, And Ahaz gathered together uh, the vessels of the house of God. Um And cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. So it has in um, verse 19, moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression. So that cast away is actually um, apostasia, where okay. uh, some scholars have said the word transgression there is apostasia. So they actually made a mistake in. Um, right insane that apostasy or they said it means a transgression and so that um Kirshner was saying see it's just another rebellion scripture but it actually is the words cast away which is a physical departure right um, and so <clears throat> it is seen more as a negative thing in all of the examples right um yes so it would be a negative thing if all the christians have left and you've been left behind be negative so, you yeah. I guess so, yeah. from, from your perspective and so but one thing um <clears throat> there is a very interesting um the assumption of the virgin this is a very interesting one where this is a work in 450 <clears throat> and so it actually says here that um that the so this is apocryphal writings of course but it says, but the Holy Holy Ghost said to the apostles and the mother of the Lord, said to Mary, behold, the governor has sent a captain of a thousand against you because the Jews have made a tumult. Right. Go out, therefore, from Bethlehem and fear not, for behold, I will bring you by a cloud to Jerusalem. So there's sort of this promise that they're going to be raptured out sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The apostles, therefore, rose up straight away and went out of the house, bearing the bed of the lady of the mother of God, and went forward towards Jerusalem, and immediately, just as the Holy Ghost said, they were lifted up by a cloud <clears throat> and were found at Jerusalem in the house of the lady. So that's the first section. So then the soldiers turn up, and it says, um, so I've written here, we clearly have a depiction of a rapture. So they're lifted up, and they're found in Jerusalem, a bit like what happened in mm -hmm. uh, the book of Acts with uh, Philip. Um, we have a dis description of the rapture of the apostles and mother of the Lord. The story continues in section 33 and it says, but when the captain came to Bethlehem and did not find there the mother of the Lord nor the apostles, he laid hold upon the Bethlehemites for the captain did not know of the departure, which is apostasy of the exact same word in uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 3. He did not know of the departure of the apostles and of the mother of the Lord in Jerusalem. So what I've found is oftentimes words like lifted up, they're using different words like say harpazo and things like that. Right. So when, when people discover the other side of the coin, <clears throat> these people are gone, they're using the word apostasia. So um, the mm. captain goes in and goes, oh, they've apostasia, they're, they've gone, they've departed. Right. Right. And so this is clearly in a context of a rapture. And, and this is in 450 AD in the Greek. And it's not changing the word. It's not changing it from um, a verb form to a noun form or anything like that that Alan Kirshner talks about. I've strictly only done my study with the exact same wording. Right. And I've this example in an apocryphal work, um, which I wouldn't agree with, but I would say that they're using apostasia to talk about the departure, which was mentioned as a rapture from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Mm. Okay. So now would, would you see the words falling away as, as translated by the King James guys? Um, are there any other examples of the, of, of falling away being used in that sense? I would imagine like a quick search. It's not like yeah. the other Bibles might. And so obviously the um, 
the departing is in the vast majority of uh, Reformation Bibles. The falling away first um, appeared firstly in the Bishop's Bible. Right. Um, but I, I probably have written on this. I've just got to find where that's at. And so the translators to the reader, I checked that, they usually use it in a sense of departing from the faith. And so even in their chapter heading, I have on my website, it shows that there shall be a departure from the faith. So to me, they got that wrong. Just like they were saying in their preface that the Pope is the Antichrist. I would say the Pope is an Antichrist. But as far as him yeah. being the, the last day's Antichrist, I, I think the Antichrist is going to be an Assyrian um of Assyrian descent, so I don't uh, think that it has anything to do with Rome. Or... Yeah, um, but uh... the KJV Today article, um, they I was surprised because I hadn't read this article, and they are in complete agreement <clears throat> with me. And so when I started going through, you know, a lot of Will Kinney stuff, he's in disagreement. The KJV Today says <clears throat> um, it means falling away, which in English is a gerund, a verb turned noun. Without the yeah. article, the passage would read in a sense of the day shall not come except the falling away comes first. The substantiva makes it clearer that falling away is an event noun rather than a generic act of falling away verb. Right. Since there is no indefinite article in Greek, the best way to, to substantivize the noun and give it greater force as a noun is to proceed the verb like noun with a definite article since the definite article here is neither anaphoric nor cataphoric referring to something previous or following the um dick tick <laughs> i'm struggling with some of these technical words yeah. uh, demonstrative pointing to something there is no need to translate the article as the definite article in english english has the indefinite the indefinite article which serves as a substantivizing function so a falling away is a valid translation and so i know the guy from the king james version today website he chooses to remain anonymous i know who he is i know he's a polyglot he's um <coughs> he several different languages he knows greek very well and hebrew very well but he chooses to remain anonymous because um uh yeah who wants to be the king james guy and get your head beaten with a stick sure um, like i do <clears throat> but he describes it here as um, the most literal translation is falling away. Apostasia derived from apo, away from, and stasis, standing. So it means away from standing or falling away. Rebellion is a figurative meaning since the act of rebellion is due to falling away from authority, whether it be from truth or government. Although it is common to interpret this falling away as the end time rebellion, the literal translation enables the reader to interpret falling away as referring to the departing of believers from the earth in the rapture. In a chapter as mysterious and ambiguous as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it may be wise not to translate anything too narrowly in a way that um, eliminates the possibility of valid, uh, various valid interpretations. So can, can you go back? What what was the reasoning for not translating the def, the the article there uh, before apostasia? E apostasia proton. So it says in regards to the article apostasia, I might enlarge in this so we everyone yeah. can see it. <coughs> hmm. It should be able, you could probably share the screen there even uh, if you hit the present button on your uh what is this yeah. So I'll go at the stage, um, find KJV, whoops, wrong page, KJV today, there. I can hear your computer <laughs> fan just whirring away there. It's actually my um, normal fan. It's oh, actually nice. quite, quite hot here today, so. Um, in regard to the article, apostasy is preceded by a, the definite article. The definite article um, would normally be translated as the. However, the KJV reads a falling away. This is because the use of the article here is to sub substantivize the verb-like noun. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. 
And so I'll put that link into the chat. And I'm pretty sure I did a whole thing on falling away. So it, I guess it's a bit like um, nine or six um, perspective. So we see things like this. Yeah. Some people are looking at a nine. Some people are looking at a six. So some people are looking at the the rapture that's happened. Yeah. The harp the harp page of the catching away. Other people are looking at a departure that happened. Right. So some well, this kind of reminds me of the discussion surrounding uh, Matthew twenty four, uh, when it's talking about two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Uh, mm. There's many interpretations which go either. The ones taken are the ones taken in the rapture, or the ones taken are the ones taken in judgment. Um, so uh, that that's uh, uh, we probably won't talk about that today, but that's an interesting correlation. Um, that it's kind of a similar idea here. Yeah, uh, um, I'll just see if I can look at a Greek grammar chart. What are you looking for? So this, this type of chart here. Oh, I'm there we go. This. Yep. <laughs> oh, it's away from, yeah. Um, hopefully I can find a good picture of it. There we go. Won't have to enlarge it. Yeah, the kids are having a ball there. It sounds great. Yeah. Oh, you can hear them. Yeah, but that's fine. It's at least you've got life in the house. <laughs> They're supposed to be going to bed. It's ten o'clock, and they got church in the morning. <laughs> Maybe I should go tell them to go to bed. Just give me one second. Yeah, no worries. up for the little ones nice thank you okay. i have pasta seed for a second there <laughs> you did depart um you have you have paid well you weren't half paid so because you didn't get kidnapped no by someone i didn't go up the stairs but according to me, you you did a you did apostatize. Apostasy. Um and I think the thing is too, we have an English word apostasy, which right. only strictly really means that you've departed from, departed faith, from and the faith. Belief. Yeah. So what I find is people hear apostasy and they go, Oh, apostasy. It's a bit like words like metamorphosis. We think, oh, well, it's gotta mean the butterfly story. Um, yeah, yeah. We squeeze those. Uh, definitions onto a term um mm -hmm. yeah so but yeah so we see the apo is from and so from standing um it yeah. is you know the apo means you you've left you you departed it's mo movement uh, away from yeah which um if someone's standing there and they've gone from that position it's <clears throat> pretty pretty easy to see the that they've fallen away um fallen away it comes from the position of you know, like i was saying with the six or the nine depending on your mm -hmm. perspective of where you're yeah. standing from if um, people in the if the pre-trib rapture is true people in revelation chapter six are saying well all these christians have just departed from us they've yeah. fallen away from us so there is a falling away and then that wicked is revealed. And so, but one th one thing that's really um, sort of powerful for me, in a sense, where when I'm reading these verses, 
is the consistency of if I read, say, Falling Away, if I just read that as departure, now, obviously, I think Falling Away is fine, it's valid, but mm. departure, I sort of have to say that, just like when we're getting rid of the Easter, Ishtar type of thing, I might have had to say, well, this is the celebration of the resurrection or the, the post-resurrection verse or whatever. So sometimes you have to define things until people get it. So it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a departure or a falling away first. So that's right. the first thing that's got to happen. So to me, that's the rapture is going to happen first. And then it says, mm. and then that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So it doesn't say that that's the first thing, the man of sin revealed. It just says, and after the, the falling away first, that man of sin is revealed, whether that's the second thing or the 10th thing or the 100th thing, it's just right. going to happen after after it. But then when we go down a little bit, it talks about the Antichrist who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now, so it says, and now he that withholdeth, um, sorry, and you know um, what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Right. And it says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or restrains yeah. will let or will restrain until he's taken out of the way. And then shall that we could be revealed. So do you so think is, that's the church? I, I do, in a yeah. sense, because I believe it's parallel to verse 3. Because it right. says here that you're falling away first, a departure <laughs> yep. first. Here it says, um, he that now let or restrains he that restrains will restrain until he is taken out of the way then the very next thing says and that man of sin be revealed the very next thing here says and then that wicked shall be revealed so i believe these are actually parallel type verses and so you see the falling away or departure first then the man of sin is revealed here you say he that restrains will be taken out of the way then that wicked will be revealed so he's sort of repeating that type of theme of a departure, something being taken out of the way, the restrainer being taken out of the, out of the way, then the very next thing is, then that wicked will be revealed. And so um, when I read through that, w when I started to understand the concept of the, the apostasy of being just a general departure and not a departure from um, teachings or from the faith or, you know, which historically a lot of people have put that baggage onto it. Mm, sure. Then... I matched that up with verse seven and said, okay, this is the same as he that restrains will restrain until he is taken out of the way. So I believe that that's um, in a sense where the Holy spirit is still going to save people in the tribulation period. I don't believe that, you know, they're going to have to believe a different gospel and all this other stuff. That can keep. Right. But um, that, and the Holy spirit will be at work there, that they, they will get saved the, the same way that we get saved. But in a sense where that restrainer, um, is us, we are born again, we have Christ, we, we are taken up, and according to the world, we've fallen away. Yeah. Um, and we are a restrainer, and it says, until he be taken out of the way. Okay, the let, next... let me ask you about, yeah, the, the pronoun there. Um, so, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Um, has, has the church ever been referred to as a he? Or does that, or does that not matter here? Um, well, I guess in a sense, I think it's talking about um, the the body of Christ, mm -hmm. and I know some people would say, you know, this is um, the Holy Spirit in the church that basically makes who the church is. Because right. I actually in, heard one interpretation too, uh, where some someone suggested it was Michael the Archangel. Okay. That, yeah, that's I, I I'm not sure on that, right? I, I haven't looked too far into that. Um, uh, yeah, I kept hearing all ages. Uh, no, Ecclesia is uh, Ecclesia is feminine. Yes, yes, it is. Um, that's why I'm asking about he. <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm co-opting yeah. your comments. Sorry, Nick. Um, yeah, and so that's where I um when you're saying oh is, is it the church? See, I believe when the church departs, that that this is talking about the Holy Spirit. Only he who now let will let until he's taken out of the way. And so, but that is because the church has left as well. 
So right. the, rest, the restraining force in the world, um, born again Christians, you know, um, sort of making a stance for morals, for, you know, things um, on this planet. We are, are the salt of the world and all that. But it's because we have the Holy Spirit who is masculine in us and uh, he is the restrainer and he will be taken out of the way. When that is taken out of the way, that's because the church has been, uh, has departed and mm -hmm. we've gone. Yeah. So I, you know, I can, I can speak to kept pure in all ages. Uh, uh, oh, I, I, I can't believe I forget your first name. It's Christensen. <laughs> uh, McShaffrey. McShaffrey. That's it. Um, yeah. So there is an example of, uh, Pnevma, when referring to the Holy Spirit, where it's it's in the masculine, somewhere in John, um, I, I recall using that while talking to um, a Jehovah Witness. Um, but uh, yeah, that that is that is an interesting question. So if I come back to you, Nick, what you're saying then is that you believe that it's the church that's restraining, but specifically it's the Holy Spirit through the church restraining. Yes, because we are the body of Christ. We are his hands and his feet. It's not <coughs> right. like Christ is this invisible sort of gas that's just floating around the earth. He is within the believers. And um, people don't become like born again until we go there. We preach. We, we touch them with the gospel of Jesus. And like I understand some talk about Muslims having dreams and visions and all this sort of mm -hmm. stuff. But the vast majority of Christian work is because we who have the Holy Spirit, we have Christ in us, we go and we shine the gospel to them and that's how they get saved. So we are the, uh, we are a restraining force as well because mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit in us. And so once we're out of the picture, where's the Holy Spirit then? It's back to zero, zero Christians on earth, right down to everyone gone in the rapture, all the Christians gone and then it's got to start again so which is a, a pretty um powerful image right then we can we can go back to mark 16 9 through 20 on that right taking up serpents as a way of restraining yeah um yeah. yes in a sense where um if you are in in a town and you know half the population is christian i know that will probably be rare nowadays but when yeah. you go to places like I've preached in many different places where there are lots of Christians in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, um, Cambodia, some of the whole towns are all Christians. Like imagine they're, they're all gone and there's only just a few people left. Like, And those few people have no interest in God or living for God. They see this departures happened. Um, they, um, there is a restraining force there that has caused them to not just be wild um, mm. and not just live it as the way they right. want, like the Christian standing out the front of an abortion clinic or something like that. And that's right. not going to be there anymore. There, there are going to be the fake Christians left behind, of course. Oh, sure. Wild. Sure. But um, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did, did you catch um, some of my, I, I chose to kind of step away from the conversation just because I was getting super angry with it. <laughs> but back when I was uh, responding to the cessationist video, did, did you watch that? I, th I think I did. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I just, I put things on audio and I just listen to them. And um, I've listened to so much stuff that if you asked me what I listened to last week, I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm just yeah, constantly it. listening. Yeah, so I, I did, uh, I don't know, like four or five videos uh, responding to some of the uh, some of the claims on there, and uh, I, it just, uh, I, I know you started you started popping those videos up and, uh, and looking over them, but I remember thinking I was I was getting so upset with the conversation, right? Because there's just to me it's just some very clear reasoning why why we should be cessation or continuationists. Um, and then we're being misrepresented and then thrown into the fire with the likes of um, uh, Bethel and, and Benny Hinn and Todd White and, and uh, Todd Bentley. Oh, Todd Bentley. So <laughs> anyway, I decided to kind of pull off of that train and, and, and go back onto the text of critical train. Um, so I, I do more of the continuation cessation stuff with the, with the church. 
Um, the, the text critical stuff, I, I typically don't touch a whole lot with at the church, but I'm um, just, just here and there. Yeah, it, it is it is hard for me too because since the 1990s, <laughs> I've come against Benny Hinn actively and mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth Copeland because I didn't know who these people were at all. I, I just started going to work and people were like, oh, you're – you're one of those Benny Hinn guys. I'm like, who's that? No, nope. I'll be going on TV in the morning because I'd moved to state and everything. I had a whole bunch of guys after me trying to kill me and all the rest of it. So I had to move into state. And so <clears throat> I'm working a job and I didn't know early morning TV is just all these guys, you know, the, these weird Christians. And so mm. um, they're saying, oh, yeah, praise the Lord, Benny Hinn. You know, and they're just mocking this whole thing that I really know nothing about. And I, I sort of had to study, oh, okay, who's Benny Hinn? And I'm looking it up kind of, well, that's not what I do. Um, and then yep. the Pensacola thing happened uh, in 96. I was only Christian for about a year then. Um, and I had to make a stand against that because there were a few churches in our fellowship that started to gravitate towards that and they left and joined it. Um, and then I, I basically joined a discernment ministry called um, uh, Contending Earnestly for the Faith. And I was right. general secretary of the Assemblies of God in Australia. So he was high up. He okay. knew all the leaders of Hillsong and Phil Pringle and all these other leaders. And he left and said that Benny Hinn is a false prophet. Um, Kenneth Copeland's false. You need to get away from these guys. But mm -hmm. they, they kept inviting Rodney Howard Brown over and all this stuff. So he left mm -hmm. and started doing a magazine sort of against that type of thing. And I, I used to run his website for years and years. And so... Some of the books that I've got, um, like this is like from the 1990s, Wade and Found Wanting, the <clears throat> okay. uh, by Bill Randall. So he's a Pentecostal pastor in the United States. Yeah. And he's basically saying, you know, Rodney Howe Brown, the Kansas City Prophets, John Wimber, um, some of the vineyard groups, are, are, and he just proves where they've got false prophecies, um, false manifestations and things like that. Um, and... Aaron Morgan, he used to be the head of the AOG in the UK. He wrote a book, The Biblical Testing of Teachings and Manifestations. Oh, okay. So that's Aaron Morgan. So it's a whole book basically about false signs and wonders and true signs and wonders. So it's coming, it's having the same type of critique, but from a believer's perspective, from a, from, from continuationist. And I interviewed... Um, uh, Bill Randall, so he's passed away now, but I got to interview right. him about okay. what is he think of Todd Bentley, what do you think of um, uh, Benny Hinn, what do you think of these guys? And so for probably the, as long as I've been a Christian, since like 95, 96, I've actively come against Benny Hinn, actively come against these mm. false prophets. But then when you talk about healing, oh, you're a Benny Hinn supporter. It's like it, it's, it, it does my head in because... It, it's right. just like being called a Ruckmanite, you know. Oh, you you follow Peter Ruckman, and you're like, right, well, right. It's again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now it's really interesting because uh, Todd Bedley, uh, of all people, uh, we I, I grew up in London, Ontario, uh, so in kind of like the southern end of Ontario, Canada, right, yeah, right smack in the middle of the little thing between the lakes. And he came there. He came to the Greek Hellenic Center. Uh, and we went, we, because we, you know, we were in a little Bible study and, and uh, uh, we would take field trips every once in a while. Right. And so we heard about this guy and, you know, the spirit of the Lord was upon him and all this kind of stuff. And so we went there and I, it was packed out, right? Like there were tons of people there. And I don't remember a whole lot except for two things really stuck out. One is he was talking about how, uh, well, they, they, they do this game, right, where they stand up and they say, you know, we'll, we'll so-and-so, um, somebody with uh, the name that begins with M, and you have a lot of back pain, and, and would you just come up and we'll pray for you, and you'll get your healing. Like, they were doing kind of like one of these things. You know, that's what mediums do, but <laughs> Todd Bentley was doing it, right? Um, anyway, so that went on. I remember looking at um, our Bible study leader, and he was just looking at me, and it was like, this this is right out anyway so the worship time came and they started playing this music and he prophesied over this one guy that he was going to go to some country and, and and be a witness for jesus and so the band just started playing for a worship song uh you know leaving on a jet plane and i was thinking like well, what's going on here <laughs> yeah yeah i i 
we ended up meeting up with somebody else there that we knew. And we were all just like, this is so dumb. What's going on? Uh, anyway, so that was my experience with Todd Bentley. And then, you know, shortly after all that stuff came out and, and uh, yeah, it all, all started to make sense. Uh, he's clearly a false teacher. He had some really weird ideas and, and stuff he talks about being abducted by – or sorry, taken to heaven by angels. But it sounds more like an abduction story, like, you know, aliens abducted me and blah, blah, blah. It's just bizarre, bizarre stuff. Anyway, so – yeah, the, the stuff I kind of we kind of saw early on uh, in our walk with the Lord, like the, the, this stuff is right out. And then, of course, you've mentioned Kenneth Copeland and and uh, he's probably the worst. I think um, yes. Kenneth Copeland, Todd White, um, Rodney Howard Brown, Catherine Kuhlman, um, you know, uh, all these people you, you, you think are really great. And then when you start really looking into them, you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> Very interesting. And anyway, so when you say, when I say like I'm a Pentecostal pastor, I have to do a little bit of work to separate myself from, from these people <laughs> who are clearly producing heresies. Um, so anyway. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons why I, I say <clears throat> I'm part of Revolution Church. I, I've sort of tried to have a new label because you've got Pentecostals, you've got Charismatics, and mm -hmm. then you've got... Um, I'm like, okay, I'm a revolutionary. And they're like, okay, what is that? And then I can define it without all the baggage that these other labels, it's because saying, sometimes saying you're a Pentecostal, people just go, oh, Benny Hinn and Crefler. Yeah, and yeah. And they just think that immediately. So I, I realized after years and years and years, I couldn't have any type of label like that or, you know, even I guess continuationist, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's more a technical term that a lot of people don't, uh, tend to use but yeah you, when you're debating you tend to say that type of thing but um yeah well, one funny story is um when benny hinn came to australia um sorry it wasn't benny hinn it was rodney howard brown so he intro introduced the toronto blessing that came from um, canada came from toronto in mm. 1993 uh that outpouring of the holy spirit sort of thing happened and so they came to Australia to spread it and, you know, spread the Holy Spirit around. And what happened was um, some pastor friends of mine, they were, they just went along just to, you know, they were a bit bored and they're like, let's just check this out. You know, they weren't getting hmm. interested in getting prayed for or anything. And so what happened was someone two seats back um, passed wind loudly. And <laughs> a few people started giggling oh, like, man. oh, that's pretty funny. And Rodney Howe Brown says, there it is. That's the movie. Oh, movement. no. Oh, Which made no. them laugh even more. We, and then it actually set off the whole entire stadium, and they all started laughing. And so that's how the laughing revival entered into Australia. <laughs> <laughs> By a fart. <laughs> oh, no. And um, it's because I, I, I was I was in a church where we we wouldn't even think that uh, slain in the spirit was part of, you know, biblical manifestations and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I usually say it's sort of like the gateway, the marijuana of man manifestations that leads to, you know, the sure. soaking sure. and, you know, falling over and all that sort of stuff. So um, when I whenever I pray for someone, they never fall over. Uh, I, I've prayed for you know, thousands and thousands of people when I'm overseas. I might pray for three, four hundred people in a day, uh, out street mm. preaching. People come up to me and say, "Can you pray for this? Can you pray for that?" And I'm constantly sure. praying. Never see them fall over. Never, never see them in a drunken stupor or anything. Yeah, like yeah. That. If they've got a T, in if it's in an area where they have a lot of TV, yes, yeah, that you'll you'll see that because they learned this behavior. Right. They're watching Benny Hinn. They're watching, it. and so. Uh, in, if you're in Australia, I'll go to a church and people are like, oh, you know, but it's not from me praying for them. It's usually mm -hmm. I'm just watching this going, these people have learned this type of behavior. Um, but, you know, I, I've got nothing against any um, any gifts of the Holy Spirit or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do believe thoroughly in healing. And I, I guess in a sense, mm -hmm. I've sort of come full circle where I never used to sort of teach or believe that everyone should be healed. But I've changed my mind on that because we're to be like Christ. Everyone who touched Jesus was healed. The Bible says there were so many people touching him that they actually put him in a boat because they were worried that they were going to throng him, it says. So right. everyone's just touching, touching. It's not just a woman 
with the issue of blood touching the hem of his garment. Hundreds of people just touching, touching, touch, and getting instantly healed. Okay. And so, okay. Um, understanding so, that. So, so what is the thorn in the flesh then? Because I, I'm, I'm in the place where not necessarily everybody's going to get healed, right? Um, yes. I don't think just because you're a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be healed of everything. Mm. Um, so uh, the thorn in the flesh, um, actually, I, I preached on this last week. Okay. Um, I, I would see the thorn in the flesh as uh, some sort of physical infirmity. In fact, uh, Paul calls it an infirmity a few verses down, right? Mm. Um, so one, it, it, it's definitely not a sin. Right? I've seen people use that to justify uh, to justify a sinful lifestyle, right? Like, oh, it's my thorn in the flesh and God puts oh, it here yeah. to keep you humble. It's like, no, God does not give you sin to keep you humble. Okay, that's that's not what it is. Um, uh, but Paul goes on to call it an infirmity. Uh, so it's mm. some sort of weakness. Now, I, I know there's discussion about whether, you know, Galatians and see with what large letters and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but I, I I don't know. I, I'm just getting the impression that it's some form of physical weakness uh, that is painful for him. Otherwise, he wouldn't use the term thorn in the flesh. Um, so God didn't take it away. He left him with whatever this pain was um, to keep him humble for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so if we come to the scriptures saying everybody should be healed, um, everyone who, who, who is a Christian, um, it's God's will for them to be healed. Um, what do we make of Paul with his thorn in the flesh? Mm -hmm. So um, Paul the thorn, in the, flesh, the thorn in the flesh is actually an Old Testament quotation that if they don't rout out um, the people out of the land of Canaan, they will become a thorn uh, in the flesh. So uh, when you read through that, if you understand that the King James Version uses the word infirmity for just weaknesses, and yeah. the vast majority of the time the New King James does uh, update that word um, as weak weakness, except for those verses around the thorn in the flesh. It uses right. the words infirmity. So this is one of the, the things that I've pointed out that I think is not um, acceptable in the New King James, because if it just had um, a weakness instead of the mm -hmm. word infirmity, because most of the time we think of infirmity as a sickness nowadays, where in 1611 they did right, right. a weakness. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, when, when it's talking about thorn in the flesh, oh, that equals an infirmity, that equals a sickness, then we already had that seed planted in our mind. When you understand right. that it's re relative to the Old Testament of routing out the um, the Canaanites, basically what's happened is um, God promises that we'll have a blessed Christian life, but he says you'll suffer persecution. So Paul, right. wherever Paul went, the Jews were there ready to smack him over the head with a rock or, you know, kill him or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And he was having a really hard time with these Jews. And so he says um, that this, uh, I might actually get the verse up because it's, it, that's in Second Second Corinthians, isn't it? Second Corinthians. I'll just write thorn in the flesh. Might be easier for me to. Yeah, to sure. Um, I'll he calls it a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Yes. So um, I think it's the unsaved Jewish community that he was part of and, and he was a persecutor like them. He was a messenger yeah. of Satan, of enemies, enemies of God. And, and these mm -hmm. people um, are constantly bashing, bashing him up, uh, causing problems for him. So it says... Um, that he had an abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan mm. to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. But this thing I, I um, besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Right. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is my perfect and <clears throat> weakness. So this is a good verse to, mm -hmm. to define the word grace is strength. Most gladly, therefore, I um, will I rather glory in my infirmities um, that the power of Christ mm -hmm. may rest upon me. So that infirmity is, is just weaknesses. So when you say, I'd rather right. glory my weaknesses, it, it changes the whole context of that. Because uh, in, in New King James, it does say infirmities as well. Therefore, I take yeah, pleasure I think, in infirmities. I think it's the same word. Sorry, I'm just looking yes. at uh, I think it's the same word between the two. It's asthenia. Yes, so they updated weaknesses everywhere else except for there. Um, in this right. chapter, so, so I think it's 
find that that's they're actually putting into that, that verse something that um that should have been updated and changed to match the rest of the verses or else they right. they've got a theological bent to say that this is specifically a sickness right um so yeah verse 10 in the new king james says i take pleasure in infirmities but if, if you were to just read that, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in reproaches, yeah. in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's yeah. sake. For when I'm weak, I'm strong. So for me, he's just suffering. Uh, this is not to do with any type of sickness. It's only just because infirmities didn't get updated with um, the other words, the other times infirmities appears in the King James. It's just in this chapter they have infirmities there. Other times it's um, it's translated as weakness, weaknesses, which I, I would agree with that, yeah. that reading. Yeah, so if yeah. you change that word and say, therefore I take pleasure in weaknesses, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, yeah. for my sake, you can sort of see that it changes the tone of it and perhaps this is mm -hmm. what Jesus promised. All who right, live in God right. Jesus will suffer persecution. He, uh, he said he, he sought the Lord to take this away and he said my strength is sufficient for you in other words you can go right. through this persecution paul right uh, interesting same word all around very cool yeah all right well i should probably duck out i gotta finish up for tomorrow so yeah i just saw you come on and i was like ah, yeah it'd be fun let's let's pop in there and talk to nick for a bit yeah it's always good chatting with you Dwayne. and um yeah you i enjoy your thought provoking um questions and pointing out different things it's it's keeps me on my toes <laughs> sure thing <laughs> all right nick thanks for uh thanks for hosting me well uh we'll see you around might cheers, keep you bye. on in the background all right bye cheers mate see ya how do i get out of here oh there it is okay all right <laughs> see ya okay so let's jump up to where <clears throat> Okay, so I sort of went through some of these. Um, some people were asking me about the KJV 2023. Would I consider printing a red letter edition? So what had happened was I'd worked pretty hard. Um, we had actually paid a printing group to print the Bibles. They were going to do 500, um, but they took four years to do it. And so, and I pointed out many mistakes in their editions. And unfortunately, um, we lost all our money um, with that. So it was um, it was a huge project and it didn't work. And so what I did was print on demand. So this was the KJV 2016 edition, which I've updated in the KJV 2023 edition. Um, and I, I believe a lot of these type of issues that I'm talking about, like say having infirmities here where it, uh, a modern um, rendition would be uh, weaknesses, but the New King James uses everywhere else. But... Um, we can see here that they don't they think that this is a sickness and so i've just put weaknesses there so then you can make up your mind whether that weakness is a sickness or um but it's just to make that more uniform rather than have two words the infirmities and the weaknesses now when it's talking about christ heal people of their infirmities of course we, we can still use that as sicknesses but um and so, yeah, the KJV 2023, um, printing a red letter edition. So what I'd actually done, I got the um, edition that they sent me to proofread for the Bible that um, failed to really make it. And I copied that through a Word document and uh, ironed out any issues that I saw there. Because what was happening was these people were actually putting words in italics for emphasis. So everywhere where it said amen, they put it in italics. And I'm like, why are you messing with the text? Italics means it's not in the original Greek. Don't do this. And so I had to, they would make that type of mistake. I had to proofread the whole entire Bible and go through and say, no, you've, why are you changing this? And so it was actually a bit of a nightmare. But what it did, it made me read through that edition over and over. And I've read that edition so many times. Um, so what happened was I made my own P, um, Word document and then I put it into PDF and it was a red letter edition. But the cost of a red letter edition was so much that um, 
like to print in color i thought no one's going to want to buy it and so i actually put it as black and white so i changed the pdf to black and white and then when i uploaded it um, i bought the thing and it came up as a light gray color that that's supposed to be red now at first i was like well will people like this and so what i've actually done is i sent it away to some freelancers they fixed that problem so now it all reads in black so um so that's what i've done to do a red letter one um that probably will happen in the future um but i sort of walked away it was a, about june last year between june and maybe september october i was just that was my main project i was constantly listening reading listening reading going over double checking triple checking to the point where i was actually really exhausted from the project because i was doing it all by myself and sometimes um, when you don't have the skills of a printer you might have the skill to be able to go well infirmities here is because of the thorn in the flesh people are saying that this is a sickness um and you might be able to spot those type of things and go well i don't think that's a good translation of that word but <clears throat> i'm not saying the king james is wrong at all because that's exactly what it meant in 1611 was weakness i can spot those things but um working with um pdf documents word documents trying to get everything perfect for a print run it's like i'm not schooling that <laughs> it's, it's hard work and um yeah so eventually i would like to have um you know people on board who could some someone pointed out that there is quite a big mistake in one of the verses in revelation where it looks like two verses have actually meshed together and it's one verse and it's like so i'm going to have to fix that um but that takes uh, just time effort money and i guess in a way once i sort of got it to the point where i'm like okay we're, we're printing it i i was fixing up all the mistakes and then so someone recently has shown me there's a there's a verse in the book of revelation and there was also the verse in um matthew chapter three or chapter two maybe or well, chapter three where it's no chapter four where it's talking about the devil and i capitalized one of the hymns or he's i think it's him but it's actually talking about satan <laughs> so people will be like he's saying satan's deity <laughs> it's like uh no it was just because sometimes when you're going through such a big work like that you might spot um an error and you or what you think is an error so you fix it but you've actually um you you haven't spent as much time as you originally did on that and so you can make those type of errors you know, capitalize capitalization spelling etc um but yeah they're the only things that i've found wrong with that and so eventually um i would love to have um get yeah, more of those uh printed and brought out so it's quite amazing that um you know i would be labeled as a ruckmanite as a follower of gal ripplinger blah 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 i don't know any any of those people who would um support a modern uh you know, king james edition so i've done the 2016 edition and uh the 2023 edition is the most updated one now if you want to see what this is all you have to do is go to my texas receptor site uh, straight away it says uh, King James Version 2016 23 edition and you can read the whole thing online so you can check readings um, yeah, go wherever you want so so we're at where were we in 2nd Corinthians 12 <clears throat> we'll just have a look at that So a messenger from Satan, it says, therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses. So notice I don't have infirmities there. In reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And so to me, that's a better reading than what the New King James has. And I've thought about that one for quite a long time. I've noticed it maybe 20 years ago, thought about it, thought about it, and gone over it uh, quite a lot. And so um, to me, this has nothing to do with sickness. And so anyway we will yeah so that's a 2023 um 
so mr sam says i would say we view the apostles with a capital a and the apostles um, small a as different things we aren't seeing today's apostles being inspired by god to write scripture well some false teachers think they do well i think there are um i, I you know most people who believe in gifts and, and all that they believe that the canon is closed they're not saying that it's an open canon and or open you know slather for just adding to the words of god and all that sort of stuff but um to me like there are people who um <clears throat> I mean, Luke, Mark, there, there were people involved with writing uh, scripture. They might have a link to an apostle, say like Paul, but Paul's not part of the 12 either. So this is where people are like, oh, well, Paul, you know, he's just like the 13th apostle, you know, sort of thing. Well, what about Barnabas? He's called an apostle. Um, it, it just becomes, to me, it's just a title for someone who's done something. They've gone out and been a missionary. So then they're like, well, I'm a missionary. I'm an apostle. So to me, that makes sense. Um, Mr. Sand says, just to give one example of the differences. Yeah, and I appreciate you um, talking about that. Dwayne, I was actually meeting Nick, a red letter edition of the KJV 2023 New Testament. Nick, can you tell me a little bit more about the 2023, please? And so over the years, um, so I started in a church called reading New King James, and I found it really easy to read lots and lots and lots of scripture and to understand and everything now i've found um approximately about 500 places in the new testament that i think are poor readings in the new king james that weakness one is just one of them and so um that's about two readings per chapter so i've gone through and corrected my edition according to what i think um is uh, uh obvious errors in that edition so that I could offer to people a better alternative than the New King James. Because oftentimes I would go to countries like uh, Papua New Guinea, I've been there 13 times, uh, Fiji, I've been there twice, um, Indonesia, Philippines, Cambodia, even I've lived in Pakistan. And a lot of people speak English, a lot of people read English. Um, and so say in Papua New Guinea, I street preach in English. They understand what I'm talking about. Their radio stations, many times they're talking in English the news comes on in English, TV shows are in English, but they do have their local language as well. And so, but when I give them Bibles, if I give them a local language Bible, they don't like it. They prefer the English ones, but they want something readable. And so we give them a King James and they're like, yeah, they thigh, they are, but they, they're not getting it because the level of English is not um, as proficient as someone in say Australia, England or America. So when you, I give them a new King James, they find that easy to read. So my heart for people is to have the word of God um, and not to you know, sort of cloud it. If you, I read the King James, I, I, I read it. I, I understand what the words are saying, what they're meaning. Um, I can define those words and I can use it uh, as my main Bible. Um, and so do many others, but there are places where they do struggle. And so um, I was taking boxes of New King James's up there but then there were sometimes I'll be sitting there reading through some of the readings and going, oh, they're going to get the wrong idea here. Um, you know, but it's usually only people who really study the word a lot and they get, get hung up on, on one word here and there. But there are concepts in the King James I, I just don't agree with. And so, I mean, I read that thing many, many, many times over. I compared it with the old King James many, many times. And I've also compared the KJV 2000. So when I was in the Philippines, um, I saw this Bible. So this is in about 2003. So this is the KJV 2000. And so going through this, now a seven-day event guy worked on this. I didn't know that at the time. But I was like, wow, this could be an alternative to the New King James. And so, but then I read through and I found some readings that I didn't agree with. And I was like, yeah, like some of them were better than New King James, but some of them weren't. And then I'm like, well, okay, well, I'll just use that as another Bible I've got on my shelf. And then um, you've got Jay Green's, um, you know, his modern King James. Um, yeah, this is a Greek interlinear. So he has the literal translation in the column, which is basically uh, akin to his uh, MKJV, modern King James version. Um, you have a whole bunch of other editions of Texas Receptus Bibles, um, 
so you have the MEV, which I, I think was pretty lousy, personally. Um, some readings, yeah, that, that's fine. Other readings, I was just like, especially I, I compared a lot in the Psalms. Didn't do it for me. It just um, it, it showed me that they had a lot of errors. And I proved an error in Isaiah chapter 53 with their uh, reward. So it's um, it's sort of spelled like re-reward, but they actually translated it as reward which no other Bible in history has that. They've obviously just copied from the King James. They didn't go to the Hebrew. Um, they're, they're claiming that they had like 47 translators go through it. Well, I, I doubt that two people would make that exact same mistake. And so I, I just think their claims were disingenuous. I think it was just another Bible just to make money um, or for um, you know, to make a study Bible or whatever. You know, some, sometimes people are doing that. But so I've seen all these things come and go, and I just really wanted a, um, wanted to sort of prove that it could be updated without um, losing uh, doctrinal integrity. But um, I'm open to to correction. I understand I'm only just one person, and so. But I think um, whether that one takes off and people jump on board with it and say, "Hey, th there's issues here and there," or if people use that as a bit of a um, draft, you know. Um, you know, one of the other reasons is um, we're doing, um, we've done a Bible translation into Khmer, into the Cambodian language. And so the main translator of that, oftentimes I was saying, well, the, the King James means this. The King James means that, you know, and it just, just was easier for me to go, here's a modern rendition of that. Because oftentimes you're dealing with Bible translators. How many people know Greek and Hebrew fluently to the point of the King James translators? Not many. And so usually they're translating from English. And so I was like, well, if I actually make a base TR text um, that's fully comprehensible to people in Cambodia, people in Pakistan, where I'm doing these Bible translations, then they can go through and um, just translate that into their language. Then they can use that as a draft and they can double check everything. And so that's one of the reasons that's behind that as well. So hopefully that um, clears all that up. Um, so Matt Singleton is saying, hey, he says, tradition is a belief in gambling. Revelation has faith, but he's not gambling on tradition. Yes, traditions of men can nullify the word of God. Um, Shiami says, apostasy, a discussion, yay. Um, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and then says, um, equals 2, question apostasia is late greek right so how could the word be in the lxx thanks um i think well apostasia was some people think the lxx is was written about 250 um i think that the lxx was written around the time of the early church so probably in the first or second century someone did a whole um translation of the old testament into greek and they were using that. So I don't think it's a, a BC document whatsoever. Um, that's going to be an interesting discussion. I was talking with Jeff Riddle just last week, and he was saying the Reformation uh, Bible Society, um, they are doing a conference specifically on the Septuagint and the usage of the Septuagint, what it means uh, and everything. And so, yeah, I would encourage you to go to my website and look at Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Um, you can look uh, some of the articles I've got up there. I've just thrown it up there. It's like, okay, this is what Calvin thought. Bang. You haven't really given it much thought than cut, cutting and pasting. But other things I've worked on. So you might want to go through that with a fine tooth comb and um, it will help your um, opinions on that. Um, Xiaomi says, loving the discussion. Um, prayers up for the little ones. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, Nick was left behind. Um, no, I wasn't left behind. I won't be left behind. Um, so Hudson says, is it possible that the falling away is unbelievers who have a general revelation of God, but in their unbelief over the time, uh, their falling has ended to complete the full point, the falling away. Um, setting up the new world order arrival of the antichrist just like noah egypt tarot babel sodom and gomorrah god responds to evil when it hits the tipping point 
Um, yeah, I think there there is going to be a time. It's obviously God's perfect timing when he knows, well, this is the time to rapture people out. <clears throat> and I guess it will be uh, one of those times. But I think specifically he's talking to that church in um, Thess Thessaloniki. And they they sort of think that the day of Christ is at hand. They, they think that there has already been an event. They've missed it. They're, they're in the day of the Lord. Okay. And so the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, they think they're in that period, which is to me is part of the seven year uh, tribulation period. It goes into the millennium and it goes right to the end. Second Peter um, chapter um, two, it talk, oh, sorry, second Peter chapter three, it talks about the thief in the night, etc. or sorry, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And it talks about these things that, that basically are to do with after the millennium. So to me, the day of the Lord goes from the, the time of the rapture all the way through right until the new heavens and the new earth. When you read that, that, and you have that mindset reading in the context of second Peter chapter three, it makes sense. If you're only putting that in the tribulation period, it doesn't make sense. It's talking about the earth being melted and all this sort of stuff and burnt up and modern Bibles change that. <clears throat> so you just gotta be careful. But, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opinion there, Hudson. Um, we're all learning and growing in these areas. Um, kaboom, love the truth. Uh, amen, love at revolution. That's Xiaomi. So Kepir in Hawaii just says, no, uh, Ecclesia is feminine. And so that's where I guess in a way, you know, being asked, oh, do you think that's a church? It's like, well, I think it's the Holy Spirit in the church, which uh, join together. And so we we depart the holy spirit departs as well um Shami, yes the body of christ in revelation 12 and it's very interesting that you, that you brought that up because yeah the male child uh when you read through revelation chapter 12 let me just grab that um revelation chapter 12 kjv <clears throat> when you read revelation 12 which does have a harpazo in it because it does say um It says um, the child was caught up. That's Harpazo to God. <clears throat> so to me, when I read through this, it says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman, Israel, was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. So uh, these are images, you know, obviously Joseph. And the 12 um, stars upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Okay, so she's with child. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. <clears throat> and behold, a red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and the, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, before Israel, and was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So um, basically, you know, Christ, as soon as Christ was born, the devil wanted to devour Christ, okay? So it says, she, Israel, brought forth the man-child, which is Christ, who was to rule all nations. It, but it's interesting, the man, uh, the, in Revelation chapter 2, it says clearly that the church is going to rule all nations. We shall rule them with an iron scepter. I'm reading, I think it's NIV or something. It was a memory song when I was a new Christian. Um, he will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. But in the in the King James, it says very much the same thing. But it basically, it says that he will rule them with a rod of iron. You know, so <clears throat> that's for the church. So all of a sudden, she brought forth a man child, Christ. He's going to rule all nations, but we're going to rule all nations as well. Okay, so this is a bit of a key indicator that Christ and the church eventually become one. And so then it says, and her child was caught up, raptured unto God and to his throne. So here it's saying she brought forth a male child and he was going to rule all nations. But so is the church so that we're, we're sort of representing exactly the same things as Christ. He's the light of the world. We are the light of the world. He is righteous. We are the righteousness of God. He is holy. We are holy. He, um, he, 
you know, all, all the attributes that Christ has, we have now because he's given them to us. <clears throat> and her child, which wouldn't just be Jesus anymore, it's Jesus and his bride. They're one flesh. Was caught up, harpazo, unto God and to his throne. And the woman Israel fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared. So this is after the rapture of the woman Israel flees into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 2,000 a uh, thousand two hundred and three score days it's 360 days it's three and a half years on the jewish calendar there's war in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon um so you have this whole concept of of michael fighting against the dragon the devil's kicked out of heaven and then <clears throat> it says i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our god and the power of his christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused him before our God day and night, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, you that dwell in them. So there are people already dwelling in heaven. These people are the ones who have already been raptured in the first rapture and in the uh, tribulation saints gathering um, <clears throat> and the two witnesses who have already gone up in Revelation 11. And it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. So he knows he's only got three and a half years left. Okay. <clears throat> and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman, Israel, who brought forth the man-child to Jesus and the church. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, a times and a half a time, so three and a half years from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, after Israel, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, Israel, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. What would be this seed of the woman? It would be the church. Okay. And be the body of Christ, you know. But um, also, it's the remnant. So it's not the full seed. So it's only a remnant left because others have been raptured, taken up in heaven already. So it says, the remnant of a seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So these are believers in the tribulation. So that's how I read Revelation chapter 12. So hopefully that helps. Um, Kept pure in all ages, says, and Pneuma is in. Um, new to case, yes, but the Holy Spirit is a He, um, and so I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> um, holy, whoops, Holy Spirit, um. Yeah, like masculine words like the paraclete, um, the comforter. The Holy Spirit, he, she, or it, male, female, neuter. Anyway, um, that would be quite a thing to read through all that. Um, I will touch on that probably in a, another video. That would be a very good thing for me to probably put even on my site, you know, about the, um, who is the um, he that now let, will let until he is taken out of the way. So that will be interesting. So Shiami says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Yes, I'm in agreement there. Uh, yes, uh, parakletos is masculine, masculine. Okay, so that's um, one of the things that I was just pointing out. Um, a. Hannah says in First Timothy chapter four, verse one to three, it says some shall depart from the faith. Second um, Timothy three five to seven, having, having a form of godliness, etc. Um, verse uh, chapter four, verse three to four, not endure sound doctrine, etc. Like falling away, maybe from the faith. 
Yes, and so I believe that is a departure from the faith because it actually says the faith. So if it said some shall depart, and if um, if they just used apostasy, then it just says some shall depart. They have to put this from the faith there to describe they're departing from something from the faith. Um, and so that's where uh, Second Thessalonians chapter uh, two verse three just has they will depart. It doesn't say from the faith. So we can't get something from another verse and just put it over onto onto the next verse. Um, uh, Layla Ton Hagiborim. So I'm I'm guessing that's a Greek way of saying something, which is interesting. Um, but it does sound more um, Hebrew than anything, but it has the ton there, so I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, do you take a continuous or cessationist view of the Benny Hinn, Paula White's inappropriate relationship? Um, <laughs> um, oh, ab absolutely, these guys are uh, like pretty much the, the, the biggest scammers in history. So it's sort of like saying, oh, I love United States. And it's like, oh, so you follow Joe Biden, do you? It's like, oh, no. <laughs> um, I would be against those people if I love the principles of the Constitution, um, your Bill of Rights, and, you know, those type of things. And so, <clears throat> um, so Benny Hinn, Paula White, they are both false um, they're fakes, phonies, and um, yes, I believe that they had an inappropriate relationship, um, that Benny Hinn is a scammer. Um, and I've heard uh, just personal stories. A friend of mine, he said when he was in India, uh, when Benny Hinn went to India, um, one of the pastors there was organizing, you know, um, rooms, motels and things, and they organized a whole bunch of prostitutes for the workers um, who were working with Benny Hinn Ministries. And so, um, you know, the guy who's told me that, he's very credible. He wouldn't lie to me. He talked to this guy's face. So whether that guy is telling the truth, I don't know. I don't know him. But I do hear that type of thing all the time, you know. And so you hear, like, say, when we exposed... Um, uh, Frank Houston as being a pedophile and raping 14 boys. So he was the one who started Hillsong. Um, I had people contacting me saying, yeah, well, we had uh, Frank Houston come to our church and he was telling the little boys that they were very handsome and even to the point where he's praying over people in a line. When he prayed for little boys, he pulled forward, pull them forward by their pants and looked down their pants while he's pulling them, pulling them forward. So this guy's a known pedophile, raping kids. And so he's doing that in churches. So I hear those things. Can I prove it 100%? No, I can't do that. It's just someone telling me. Um, but, you know, obviously there's more. If someone is, you know, if someone's doing criminal activity, I'm sure there's way more to Charlie Manson than meets the eye. There will be someone out there with all these stories about him that just haven't hit the media yet. Um, I'm sure that these um, spiritual psychopaths like Benny Hinn and, and um, Frank Houston, I'm sure they've done way more than they've been caught doing. <clears throat> I wondered if it was Paul's super high IQ. Yeah. Well, he had a lot of revelations from God. And so it was because of these revelations that this uh, messenger from Satan was there to sort of buffet him um, in the sense where he's going out and he's preaching these amazing revelations and these Jews are coming against him. And so it's quite an amazing picture. Second, the second Corinthians 12. Yes. Uh, thorn in the flesh. So a Hannah says thought thorn in the flesh, the persecution he experienced from unbelieving Jews. Second Corinthians 11, 21. Okay. Interesting. Um, so let's look at that. Second Corinthians 11, is it 21? Um, I'll go KJV. So it says, um, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Uh, Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Okay. Um, 
I might just jump into that whole chapter. So we're at 21. Are any Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Um, are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Um, of the Jews, I receive stripes. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that link. That's uh, very interesting. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Uh, Shiami says, Paul also said, Woe if I do not preach the gospel as if that were a, um, a great one too. And then she said, I'm, I'm assuming it's a female, uh, grateful. Uh, Helg says, it was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. The weakness may have been the result of persecutions, which seem to agree with the thorn in the sides mentioned in the Old Testament, Numbers uh, 33. I think um, there there is sort of like people trying to read into the, the scriptures that Paul had uh, something wrong with his eyes because he says, you know, I would have given my eyes. Um, oh, no, you would have given your eyes to me sort of thing. But to me, it's just like saying, look, you know, look, I would do anything for you. I'd cut off my my hand for you to to for you to be successful in life, sort of thing. You know, it's it's just Paul saying that type of thing, not that he actually needed new eyes. And also, um, it's in Galatians where it says, "With what large letters have I written unto you?" Where in the King James it says, "With a large letter I've written to you with my own hand." So usually Paul would use an amanuensis, but in this occasion, in the Galatians, he wrote it all with his own hand. Um, and it was a quite a large letter to the Galatians. And so he wasn't just sitting there dictating. He'd written it all by himself. So that's why he says that. It's not like he's writing huge, big, round letters, like, you know, because he can't see. <laughs> that, that's just read into the text. And so it, people tried to build a case that Paul got sick. Um, it's just simply not true. Um, so anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. I know that some people will disagree with me, but that's fine. Um, LA Louisiana says Ezekiel 38. Um, Shiami says maybe just thinking out aloud, messenger of Satan seems to imply a hardcore spiritual inner attack um, as his high IQ and his woe statement um, speculation only as in perhaps. Okay. The messenger of Satan was stirring up people to resist the gospel everywhere he went. Um, he was given a thorn as a gift from Satan. Very interesting. Um, Shiami says, 1 Corinthians 9.16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Uh, Shiami says, uh, thank you, Nick. I saved the link. Um, Helg says, um, Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient. And Paul said, Christ's power is made perfect in his weakness. Um, Christ's power brings healing as it always did in the Gospels. Yes, and it's very interesting. It says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so the, it, it defines grace where he's saying the grace is um, gives strength in weakness. So grace gives you strength. And so this is one of the things people only define grace as, oh, well, God has grace over our sins or whatever. But it's like, yes, God does have grace. There's about 20 different definitions of grace. Grace is gives you all the gifts. Grace um, makes you strong. It's a power word here that says my grace is sufficient for you. My, my grace is sufficient because um, my strength is my, per my strength is my perfect in your weakness. When you're weak, I can be strong, you know, so it's a power word. Um, it uh, cancels our debts, our debt of sin, um, the grace of God. Um, there are many different aspects to the grace of God, and um, it's a very interesting study to just go through everywhere the word uh, charis appears, and um, even just the English word grace is very interesting. But um, 
Uh, Shami says, Revol at Revolution, these types of open Bible discussions make my heart fill up to overflowing um, love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's really good. I'm glad you, that you enjoyed this. Um, Helg says, if Paul wasn't healed after all the persecutions, he would not even be able to stand up on his feet and continue his ministry. He was stoned, left for dead, in the deep, etc. 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. Yeah, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that um, people are sort of just reading into um, things when it's like, you know, Paul just you know, constantly just suffered from um, sickness. And I actually watched, um, was it Mel Gibson's movie about Paul, I think it was, or maybe it was just Resurrection. Maybe it was about Paul. Maybe it wasn't Mel Gibson's movie. Anyway, but it just sort of made out that Paul constantly dealt with this guilt of persecuting the church and, you know, him, he just kept having this vision of seeing these poor little children who he's just killed their parents or, or persecuted their parents and he's like, you know, really sad, still sad about it. And I was just thinking, <laughs> no, you walk in complete victory as a Christian if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. All things have passed away. All things are becoming new. They're the words of Paul himself. And so him walking around in misery, it's like, no, you're a new creation, Paul. That that Saul is gone. He's dead. He's, he, you know, he's he's not part of your life anymore. Hudson says, thanks, Nick. And so that was about 15 minutes ago, that last comment. And so I've gone for nearly four hours. It's three hours and 36 minutes. So I might... Um, pull the pin so i was going to go through my facebook page but i never got to it but i was glad that Dwayne dropped in and we had a thought-provoking discussion about apostasia and a whole bunch of other things um and so i'm glad that you guys um joined in that was really good and um god bless you guys we are in for a busy week so i mightn't see you until the weekend but um yeah just keep living for god keep reading the bible and i'll see you next time god bless you